Let's rock, baby. Hello ladies and gentlemen, today I'm going to be playing through the entirety of Devil May Cry and commentating on it as I go. In order to show the game to its fullest, I worked on each mission until I could perfect it, then splice them together. So this'll be a New Game Plus, Dante Must Die, S Rank, No Damage, No Items playthrough. Before we get into the game proper, I'm just going to let this introduction cutscene play itself out so I have some time to talk about the history of the game, because it has quite an interesting backstory. This game was directed by Hideki Kamiya, who previously worked on Resident Evil 1 and directed Resident Evil 2. While many people seem to agree that Resident Evil 2 is a very good follow-up to Resident Evil 1, I don't think it's the kind of game Kamiya wanted to make. He was just doing his best to carry on a series. Anyway, eventually the time came for them to do Resident Evil 4, and Kamiya was appointed as the director. I suppose since it was the fourth installment, and it was on a new generation of hardware, they wanted to mix things up a bit to keep it from getting stale. Kamiya then took advantage of that and sort of built the game to be more what he wanted to play, more what he wanted to make. It became more action oriented and less like a Resident Evil game. Shinji Mikami was the executive producer on this game, he created the Resident Evil series, so of course he was overseeing the series and Resident Evil 4 as a result. Eventually he saw the state that the game was in, and this is where he made a smart decision. It would have been tempting, I suppose, to tell the team to focus more on the Resident Evil aspects and tone down the action elements, but instead he did the opposite. He basically told them to forget it was a Resident Evil game and spin it off into its own thing. Apparently it took him several months to convince the management at Capcom that it was the right decision, but his persistence paid off, and as a result we have Devil May Cry. It's a little bit hard to overstate what a big deal this game was at the time. I distinctly remember the feeling if I wanted to play something like Devil May Cry, I just had to go back and play Devil May Cry again because there was really nothing else that scratched that itch. I think that's because this is the point where 3D action games proved they could be as good, if not better, than their 2D counterparts. I'd be lying if I said it hasn't been improved upon by later games in the genre, but I still think anyone with an interest in action games and the history of action games really needs to play this one. So I suppose that's your warning to go play this before you watch me play through it instead. Devil May Cry released on a console of course, but I feel like its history is more rooted in arcade games, which Kamiya is very fond of. He's related several anecdotes about his misspent youth in the arcades, which I think really highlight the sort of mindset that went into designing this game. Kamiya would have grown up when arcade games were at their zenith, and since he was young at the time, he didn't have very much disposable income. When the time came to go to the arcade, every coin that he had was precious, he didn't want to waste any of it. He wanted to get the most time out of the games that he could for the money that he had. One of the ways he could do that is if they got a new arcade machine in, then he could watch other players and formulate strategies before putting any money in himself. Eventually, if you do things like that and you take it seriously enough, you can get to the point where you can get through those games on a single credit. Arcade games are designed to be brutally difficult because that's the way they make the most money. Every time you die, you need to continue, and if you need to continue, you need to feed it more coins. So if you start doing a single credit clear on one of those games, then you might have people gathering behind you, watching you, because it's very impressive to be able to beat those games without continuing. To paraphrase Kamiya himself, it feels good to have that gallery behind you, but then there's also a temptation to show off a little, and maybe even do things out of the ordinary to impress your spectators even more. You can see where that applies to Devil May Cry, it really, really taps into that temptation to be stylish. It's a fantastic concept to build a game around, and I suppose it goes to show that all that time Kamiya spent in the arcades wasn't wasted, because it ultimately gave us Devil May Cry. We're heading into the first mission now, and although I hate to start off on a bad note, the first thing I want to address is the camera, because it's such an obvious flaw. The camera is one of those vestigial elements from Resident Evil that they maybe didn't have time to rethink or redo, and it just sort of snuck into the game as is. Now, it is a little bit better than Resident Evil, because the camera will sometimes pan around or track Dante through certain areas, which they couldn't do before because the backgrounds were pre-rendered. I've never been a fan of the camera positioning in the older Resident Evil games, but I have to admit that it does have some benefits for a horror game. Enemies were often out of view, which was a good way of building tension, you weren't sure what was around each corner. That concept doesn't really work for an action game though, I think ideally you want to be keeping the enemies on screen as much as possible. The controls are another factor as well, the Resident Evil games had the so-called tank controls, whereas Devil May Cry doesn't. 
In Resident Evil, if you pressed forward, your character would walk forward no matter what the camera orientation was, whereas in Devil May Cry, Dante moves forward relative to the camera. Now that's absolutely the right choice for an action game, but taking the fixed viewpoint into consideration, that is something the tank controls do better, because sometimes the camera will change abruptly from one angle to another. When that happens, if you're using character relative controls, then you can easily keep the character moving along smoothly, because you just have to keep holding the same direction, whereas in Devil May Cry it's a bit more complicated. This is why sometimes you'll see when the camera angle changes, Dante will suddenly change direction. I'm sure if you've played the game you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. You can mitigate it by keeping the analog stick tilted the same way, which is a nice attempt to fix the problem, but it doesn't always work and it can be kind of confusing. So I would definitely say that the camera is the biggest flaw in Devil May Cry, but it's not like that was a particularly uncommon problem at the time. The camera was the stumbling block for game designers for ages. Some might say it still is. I like a lot of the enemy designs in this game, but the marionettes are one of my favourites. A lot of games have this concept of an unseen evil manipulating its minions to do its bidding, and the marionettes are a very literal take on that. Their animations really sell the idea when they plod along towards you and those little strings become visible just above them. Naturally enough, since they're the first enemy, they're quite easy to defeat, but there's something a little bit unsettling about not knowing what it is that's pulling the strings, and knowing that you're not dealing damage to that thing directly. They're also the best showcase of the juggling mechanic, which is arguably one of the most distinctive and influential features of Devil May Cry. Apparently, juggling was inspired by a glitch Kamiya found when he was playing a pre-release version of Onimusha. He found he could keep the enemies suspended in the air if he just kept attacking them, so he took that as inspiration to turn it into a fully-fledged gameplay mechanic in Devil May Cry. Juggling had actually been around for a long time before Onimusha. It's often possible to accomplish it, at least to some degree, in one-on-one -on -one fighting games like Street Fighter 2. Devil May Cry has more in common with the ancestors of those games though. Beat em ups like Double Dragon or Final Fight, where the protagonist goes up against a horde of weaker thugs. Since those games focused on dealing with multiple threats at the same time, certain attacks would inflict knockdown to temporarily incapacitate opponents and create some space. It's easy to see the parallels with some of Dante's moves, they often accomplish the exact same thing. Those beat em ups were relatively complex in that sense compared to other games at the time, where often the most you could hope to do was inflict some hit stun whenever you successfully landed an attack. In that sense, I think this game is more an evolution of beat em ups than anything else. Juggling is just another way to control your enemy. Functionally, it's somewhat similar to the grapples you could perform in those beat em ups, where the opponent would be helplessly locked in place, giving you a chance to inflict some easy damage. The blade enemies will even break out of a juggle, which would often happen if you tried to hold someone in your grip for too long. Juggling obviously looks more flashy than a simple grab, but it's also more flexible too. Dante retains access to his entire moveset, and you can even move around while you keep an enemy suspended with the pistols. Ultimately you gain more control than ever before over the position of both you and your target at the same time, so I would go as far as to say that it's an all around superior mechanic. One on one, it's a devastating technique. Since there's so many ways to knock down, juggle and otherwise evade danger zones altogether thanks to the fully 3D environment, the combat system gets balanced out by the ranking system. Creating space is useful for avoiding damage, but the larger the distance between you and your target, the harder it is to maintain a combo against them. The timing on the style meter itself is very tight, you only get a second and a half to keep it going. It can come across as overly punishing, especially against certain enemies, but in a way I actually think it's really well designed. For example, it takes a little over a second to jump and dive kick towards an enemy using the Ifrit gloves, so if you push them away with a charged punch you get just enough time to keep the combo going. I have to admit that makes a lot of sense because the whole idea behind a combo is something that happens in an unbroken sequence, but as impressively balanced as the timer is around Dante's moveset, it can be very hard to maintain against certain enemies. Ultimately I think it probably should have been loosened up even just a little bit. I'm skipping the marionettes here, but this is something I tried not to do too often even though it's possible in lots of different areas. It feels a little cheap to me, but it can be monotonous when you're going back through an area and everything has respawned already, so in those cases I'll often just ignore them. 
Of course, many areas are blocked off so that you can't escape until you defeat everything first. In 2D games, that was less of a problem because enemies could effectively physically block the player character from moving forward. 3D space gives you a lot more ways to circumvent your opponents, which is fine sometimes, but understandably they didn't want the whole game to consist of Dante running away. Locking doors with a magical barrier isn't exactly the most elegant way to solve that problem, but I'm honestly not sure I've ever seen a better solution. If it works, it works. As you would expect on the highest difficulty, the enemies do more damage, and the bosses have significantly more health, but there's a lot more to it than that. Once you reach hard mode, the enemy layouts change dramatically, which is why I'm fighting a shadow here. Enemies can also go into their own form of devil trigger, which has various benefits for them depending on what they are. Usually it means they do even more damage, and your attacks no longer inflict hit stun unless you're in devil trigger yourself. It's particularly punishing for marionettes and fetishes because they also gain an absolutely absurd health boost. I'm gonna estimate they get about five times more health, it might even be more than that. Sometimes you can avoid devil triggered enemies by killing everything before a timer ticks down, but not always, and as if all that wasn't bad enough, the health regeneration you normally get in devil trigger is removed, so you can't rely on that either. All in all, it adds up to a huge increase in difficulty compared to normal. I think it's very impressive they went to the effort of making so many changes for the higher difficulties, especially when in a lot of other games the higher difficulty levels really feel like an afterthought. So far I've only been using Alistair, but going forward I'll want to use the Ifrit gloves sometimes instead. There's two ways to swap between them. You can press a button to do it in the middle of gameplay, or you can go into the menu and do it from there. Technically the menu is the optimal method because Dante will switch from one to the other without any sort of animation. I can't say I really care about that myself though, I'd much rather waste a second or two in game than go through the menus, so I'll be avoiding the menus at all costs. That's also why I'll be using Alistair here instead of the shotgun. Ideally, the shotgun is the best choice of gun for sin scissors, but I prefer the pistols and I don't want to bother with the menu if I can help it. Keep an eye out here and you'll also see me totally intentionally reading a book in the middle of battle. Most people wouldn't think of using the inspect button in the middle of a fight, but as you can see I've used it to take Dante's uncaring attitude to the next level. Anyway, I'm guessing the gun switching has to be done through the menu so they have time to load in the data for whichever one you choose. The little animation Dante does when swapping his melee weapon might also be to buy time for loading as well. When the game first started development, they actually couldn't fit more than one weapon in memory at a time. It's kind of crazy to imagine, but at one point Dante couldn't even use guns and a sword together. It just goes to show how difficult games development can be. They are a very unique merger of science and art. The science needs to be caught up to where the art wants to be or else there's going to be huge problems. Thankfully the programmers were able to perform the necessary incantations to get dual wielding implemented. Swapping seamlessly between close and long range attacks allows the player to stay on the offensive more often. Without it the game wouldn't have been anywhere near as enjoyable. Some missions have harder time constraints than others. I'd say this is the first one where you really have to put some work in to get the S rank on this difficulty. That's largely because of the boss fight, depending on how the boss behaves it might take a bit longer than usual. Because I'm not sure how long it's going to take, I want to use the stinger attack to cut down on the amount of time I spend on the rest of the mission. Ideally you might want to use it all the time, but I'm using it kind of strategically, I wait until I know the camera is about to transition from one angle to another. When Dante begins the animation he's locked to whatever angle he started at, so I'm free to reset the analog stick back to the neutral position. After that I can move forward like normal, so it's really just a way of smoothing out Dante's movement a bit. It's easier to keep him moving in the same direction all the time. There's nothing explicitly wrong with Stinger being a faster form of movement, but it's one of those things where once you work it out you feel compelled to do it all the time. Moving Dante from point A to point B takes up a good chunk of the playtime, so really it should feel satisfying by itself. To begin with it might seem perfectly fine, but it starts to feel frustratingly slow once you know there's a faster option. Now, I'm calling this a no damage run, but technically there is no way to accomplish that in this game. Unfortunately there's two areas where you have to lose health, there's no way around it. 
I suppose the reason they did this was to put the player under more pressure, but using a timer like they do in some other places would probably have been a better choice. I'm guessing they didn't want to repetitively use timers for everything, which is understandable, but this game is all about being cool, being stylish, and forcing players to go through an area where their health bar ticks down isn't really in keeping with that. If you want to get a better sense of why this is a problem, you should watch this bit again after you've seen the whole video. It ruins an otherwise perfect streak, making it stick out in comparison to the rest. As usual, I have the subtitles turned on so you can get some idea of what's happening while I'm yammering over it, but the subtitle option for this game leaves a lot to be desired. Phantom and the other bosses do have captions because they have a distortion effect on their voices, but Dante and Trish don't. It's especially unfortunate because the sound balancing isn't the best. Particularly before boss fights, the music and sound effects can be loud to the point where you have to strain to understand what Dante is saying. I'm pretty sure it ended up this way because the Japanese release used English audio with everything subtitled, so for them it didn't really matter that Dante couldn't be heard all that well since they were relying on subtitles anyway. He's supposed to come across as confident to the point of being brash, and he does, but it would certainly come across a lot better if you could hear him more clearly. I like to think of Phantom as a kind of tutorial boss, even though he's probably more challenging than that might imply. On an initial playthrough, just hacking and slashing will get you to this point, but it won't get you past it. Since Phantom is invulnerable in most places, it quickly becomes clear that you need to put some thought into how you're going to approach this. You're forced to experiment until you find something that works, which is what you'll have to do later, so it sets you up for success going forward. To begin with, the weak point on his back is the more appealing option, but really the most stylish way to beat him is to wait for him to fire a meteor at you and then slash it while it's in mid-air. If you do that, you can reflect it back to him for a nice chunk of damage. It's a little hard to do it consistently though, because you have to time your slash differently depending on how far away you are. It's risky. Since I'm trying to avoid all damage, I really want to take safe, consistent options wherever possible, and thankfully there is a safe alternative. If you attack at the right time, you can blow up the meteor while it's still in his mouth. Stinger is the best option for that, because if you do it too early, Phantom gets staggered anyway, cancelling his attack. And if you do it too late, you'll often intercept the meteor, in which case you don't send it back to him, but you don't take damage either. When I'm not focusing on that, you'll see I'm shooting him even if most of the shots end up getting blocked by his carapace. The reason for that is, even though they don't do any damage, they're great at building up some Devil Trigger and you really want to have as much of it as possible against the bosses because they have about twice as much health on this difficulty. This is the pattern you'll see with all the bosses going forward. They all have so much health that Devil Trigger is really the only good way of dealing damage to them. That might seem kind of dumb, and normally I'm not a big fan of the types of damage sponge enemies that tend to crop up on the higher difficulties of other games, but here it actually makes the fights a little bit more strategic. You really need to be thinking about when and how you're going to use your Devil Trigger, and also about how you're going to build it back up once it's gone. After beating Dante Must Die and playing again on normal, I felt like I was taking massive chunks out of the bosses with every hit. It's worth noting that the basic enemies don't have extra health on the higher difficulties, so it wasn't just a case of blindly turning up some dials to make the game harder. It was a very deliberate decision to give the bosses a certain amount of longevity. Ultimately, it gives me the impression that this is the amount of health the bosses were originally designed to have, which was then lowered, whereas in most other games it feels like the bosses are balanced around normal and then have their health boosted for the harder modes. There really is no absolutely right or wrong way of approaching difficulty options, especially since every game is different, but I think the way they handle it here is nothing short of perfect. As you work your way up to Dante Must Die, the game just gets better and better until it finally feels like this is the way it was supposed to be experienced. This is the only secret mission I'll be showing off, partly because I just don't like some of them, but also because some of them are so far out of the way that they're not really worth the effort. This is one of the easiest ones to get to because you just have to turn around, but a lot of the others require some serious backtracking or exploration to find. I'm pretty sure doing a secret mission helps to boost your rank at the end, but because they're often off the beaten path and require time to complete, they tend to kind of cancel themselves out. In my experience, if you just want to get the S rank, then the benefit tends not to outweigh the time it takes to do them. I'm doing this one because it's quite easy and easy to get to, but also because I want to regain some Devil Trigger by taunting the baby spiders. 
Admittedly not my finest moment, but I need a full Devil Trigger gauge for the next section. Most people will probably only ever run away from Phantom during this part, but you can turn around and kill him no problem if you know what you're doing. I love how even this scripted sort of sequence has an opportunity for you to show off a little because you retain full control over Dante. Although many of the enemy layouts are changed on the higher difficulties, some of them are still the same, particularly the ones where an enemy would normally be introduced for the first time. It makes a lot of sense, enemies have introduction cutscenes and obviously they didn't want to redo all that work. This is an exception to the rule though, you can see this statue is a cat, so usually you'd be fighting a shadow here, but instead it's a death scissors. To accommodate that, they changed the little cutscene and it's interesting to me that they would go to that effort when it's normally something they would want to avoid. I'm guessing they were looking at the game as a whole, trying to assess what other places they could have Death Scissors encounters because it's a very specific sort of encounter. Death Scissors always set up a restrictive barrier around Dante, so they probably wanted to put a bit more care into selecting the locations for these battles to better accommodate that gameplay mechanic. These fights are a perfect example of how important audio cues can be for an action game. Have a listen. Death Scissors have a habit of flying through the walls, which at first can seem a little unfair, but if you just listen out for the audio, it actually becomes very, very straightforward to dodge them. Since they only ever appear alone, all you need to do is keep your guns at the ready. Dante will always aim towards them. Then, when you hear the audio cue, all you need to do is roll perpendicularly to where Dante is aiming. Once you work that out, I think they become one of the easiest enemies to deal with. Interestingly, studies have shown that humans generally react faster to auditory stimuli than visual stimuli. I'm not especially informed as to why that is, so I won't speculate, but if you don't believe me, I'd encourage you to try a test and see for yourself. It's a very real fact that we respond more quickly to sound. Apparently, I respond to audio 69 milliseconds faster, on average. At 60 frames per second, that equates to about 4 frames. Those 4 frames could be the difference between life and death, so you could argue that audio cues are even more important than visual cues, especially for higher levels of play. These kinds of considerations are commonplace now, but it's particularly impressive for the era this game released in. Enemies attacking from off screen is an order of magnitude more common in 3D games than in the 2D ones which had dominated the action genre up to that point. It would have been easy to overlook or ignore the relatively new problem of enemies disappearing behind the camera, but instead it's been accounted for and factored into the sound design. This boss is listed as Nello Angelo in game, but I'll be calling him Nero Angelo because that's what it was supposed to be. In Italian that means Black Angel. It's in Italian because of the Divine Comedy where Dante and Virgil both get their names from. I'm not sure how much of an influence the Divine Comedy was in general, given that the game started out as a Resident Evil title. I read through it looking for connections and nothing really stood out to me except for the naming of Dante and Virgil, which is obviously intentional. Nero Angelo would have been mistranslated as Nello Angelo because of the way L's and O's work in Japanese. There isn't actually an L sound in the Japanese language, they just have an R sound, but they don't pronounce it quite as harshly as English speakers would. So when they take a word from another language into Japanese, the L's get turned into R's. If you were to get your hands on the documents for Devil May Cry and Nero Angelo was written in Katakana, it would read as Nero Anjiro instead. Consequently, when a translator sees a foreign word in Japanese, they need to ascertain whether the ors really are supposed to be ors or whether they should be replaced with L's. In this case, they guessed that both of them should be L's, so Nero Angelo becomes Nello Angelo. He's an important character and it's a good name for him, so it's a shame they got it wrong. Luckily, this isn't a story-heavy game, so it's not a disaster by any means, but the translation is very rough around the edges. It always bugged me that they chose Absolute for A instead of Amazing or Awesome or something like that. This boss is a great example of how important and useful taunting can be. After a combo, Nero Angelo will teleport away, during which time he effectively becomes invincible. I can't do any damage to him while he does that, but I also know he can't do any damage to me either, so it's a perfect opportunity for a taunt. Each time I attack him, I tend to use about 3 runes on the Devil Trigger gauge, but if I taunt him I can get some of that back. 
The amount you get for a taunt actually depends on the distance between you and the enemy. You're rewarded more the closer you are to incentivize riskier play. In this case, I can stand quite close because I know I'm safe, so I get about two runes back each time. That means, on average, I'm only losing one rune overall, so I can repeat my combo about seven times before I have to worry about building up more. Taunting also resets the combo timer, which isn't that useful, but at least it means you're not punished for trying to use it. I think it goes without saying then that it's a very valuable technique, but it's also just a very cool gameplay mechanic in and of itself. It suits the character of Dante, and it's a really, really good way of filling in those gaps in the combat where the player might otherwise not have anything to do. I think that's something this game excels at in general because of the fact that you can taunt, but also because of Dante's guns. You have a lot of options. If there's something in front of you, you can just slash away at it, but if it's not vulnerable at the moment, then you can taunt instead, and if it's not safe to taunt, you can just use your guns. Basically, it just always feels like there's something for you to be doing, and that's not something you can say about every action game. About the only thing I dislike about this fight is the cutscene at the end. I can understand from a narrative perspective that protagonist has to have some struggle along the way, or it just isn't interesting. That said, I think they went a bit too far with this cutscene, where Dante is basically about to die before his pendant pops out and saves him. I think we can assume, if not for that stroke of luck, that Virgil would have killed Dante right here. Again, from a story point of view, this is actually good because it builds intrigue. You don't know what exactly happened or why Nero Angelo spared you. You might have some theories about it, but you can't be sure just yet, and as a result, you get a little bit more invested in what's going on. It's just that once you master the boss, it clashes really hard with the gameplay where Dante seemed totally in control up until now. The problem is it's just not rewarding, and in fact it can diminish the reward of beating the boss once you see your character struggling so much afterwards. I'm not a big fan of how it plays out here, but I suppose it's worth noting that you do fight Virgil two more times, and the third time you beat him there's no ambiguity about who won, so you do ultimately get that sense of satisfaction. Maybe that eventual satisfaction is even heightened a little because of this cutscene, but I'm not sure Dante needed to be beaten near death to accomplish that. Shadows are my favourite enemy to fight against, and I think the main reason for that is their really exaggerated attack animations. When you get hit by a shadow's attack, there's really no question about what just happened because it's so obvious. Either Dante gets consumed or impaled by a giant spear or slammed into the ground. Still, because their animations are so exaggerated, they're also really well telegraphed. It's pretty easy to avoid their attacks, if you're just fighting a single one anyway. They're not without flaws though. As much as I like fighting them when they're on screen, it's a different story when they go off screen because their audio cues aren't very distinct. They make low growling noises, which are difficult to tell apart and also easily masked by gunfire, which is a problem since they're only vulnerable to guns initially. The biggest problem is when they jump into the air though. There's little to no indication about that attack unless you have a visual on them, which makes it very hard to avoid consistently if you're fighting more than one at a time. Another problem they have is they don't gel very well with the style meter. They can disappear under your feet for extended periods of time where you'll have absolutely no hope of maintaining your combo. They're not really a good example of style in general either because you're very limited in how you can attack them. Despite those issues, they're definitely my favourite enemy in terms of gameplay. Since they're so fast and aggressive, it means you end up constantly dodging these massive attacks, which is very satisfying when it works out. They're also my favourite enemy just conceptually as well. Shadows are obviously a very adaptable creature, and if you read the enemy files it goes further into that to explain why Dante can't use his sword against them. It says that in the past they adapted to fighting ancient knights. Presumably they haven't been up from the underworld for a while though, which is why Dante's guns are still effective, they haven't had a chance to get accustomed to them. While the weapon restriction against them was probably just a gameplay contrivance first and foremost, it's nice that they went to the effort of explaining it, and I think it makes a surprising amount of sense. I also like the way it stresses the uniqueness of the game, and particularly Dante as a character. It's all but saying that Dante prevails where others would fail, because he's not particularly fussy or rigid about the way he fights. He just uses whatever he has on hand to get the job done. This room is normally where you'd be ambushed by some Beelzebub flies, but their role got significantly downsized on this difficulty, so we won't be seeing any of them at all. It's a bit weird that they're missing here, but I'm not complaining, I prefer fighting the plasmas. 
The ideal strategy for plasmas is very different from other enemies. Usually when you're fighting a group of anything, you want to pick them off one by one, because the more of them that you kill, the fewer that are left, which naturally enough makes it easier to avoid taking damage. It's a pretty obvious piece of logic that applies to lots of situations in lots of games, but plasmas work the opposite way. The most unique move they have is they can split themselves apart into identical copies, but there can only be three of them active at a time. If there's three of them out, then they can't replicate anymore, so the best approach is to whittle them all down to low health and then kill them all in quick succession. It's a reversal from what the player is normally doing, and for that reason alone, I'd say they were a worthwhile inclusion. Even if they didn't offer anything unique, they would have still earned their place in the enemy lineup because of how economical they are to make. The model and animations for Dante already existed, so all they had to do was repurpose those, which is a lot less effort than an enemy would usually take. Considering then that one of the main benefits of the plasmas is that they take less work to set up, I find it very interesting that they also have a bat form. I think it could be that there was initially some kind of bat transformation for Dante which was eventually made obsolete by Alistair's flying form. It's a pretty tenuous theory on that evidence alone, but another thing to consider is Bayonetta. Bayonetta is in many ways a spiritual sequel or counterpart to Devil May Cry, and in that game Bayonetta herself can turn into a crow, which seems similar to what this bat form may have been for Dante. If my little theory is correct, then I think plasmas are a good example of how cut content can be reused in a different context so that the work isn't wasted. Interestingly, this is the second and last Death Scissors that I'll be fighting, and on normal this would be the only Death Scissors fight in this entire playthrough. I think one reason they appear so few times is because once you get used to their attacks, the fights against them tend to play out very, very similarly. You can see there's not much difference here from what I was doing earlier, so they probably didn't want to repeat that too much, which is wise. They make for a good mini-boss, but not necessarily a good regular encounter. The main reason these don't crop up too much though is that the enemy variety is just very good. There's 14 basic enemy types and 5 bosses, so if you include the bosses in the list of enemies, which I think is pretty fair, then there's 19 different types. There's only 23 missions in the game. Now, most missions will have more than one encounter, but even then you can see that it doesn't leave much room to fight each enemy more than a few times. For example, plasmas are only going to appear in this video 5 times total, and that's including the room and the corridor in this mission separately. So even though I only just encountered them for the first time a minute ago, that's 40% of the plasma fights finished already. While you could certainly say that this game is a little bit on the short side, one of the main reasons for that is because there's not much padding when it comes to the enemy encounters. There's a lot of enemies that you only fight a few times each, and that's one of the reasons why it can be so enjoyable to replay. One of the things I want to talk about is the way Alistair works, because I think it's really well implemented. Later on in this mission, when I'm summoning the elevator, you'll see I use a stabbing combo, because that's one of the fastest ways to trigger it with Alistair. That's what's called a pause combo, and it's one of the defining features of the sword play in this game. Depending on how long you pause between Dante's second and third attack, he'll then complete his combo in a different fashion. If you just press the attack button as quickly as you can, you get a standard 3-hit combo that's good at knocking the enemy down. If, on the other hand, you have a long delay between the second and third attack, then Dante does that stabbing combo, which is great for activating those dials and also for building up the style meter against certain enemies. Lastly, if you have a short delay, you get something in between. Dante does a 5-hit combo that does a decent chunk of damage and racks up a good amount of points in a short space of time. This is one of those things that's a little bit hard to define because all we do is press a button and some complex action happens on screen, but the controls just feel right. If you watch Dante between that second and third attack, the way he positions himself is as though he's building up power for that stab manoeuvre. So for us playing, it's like when we take our paws, we're building up power as well. Another good example is when you're launching, you can tap the attack button to send them into the air, or you can hold the attack button to follow them into the air. Dante is doing a longer animation when he follows them up, so you just hold the button for longer. Something about those attacks just clicks. The animations and the button presses seem like they correlate to each other the way they should. Another great thing about the pause combos is the way the 5 hit combo is in the middle of the other two. I suppose this is up for some debate, but I feel like the 5 hit combo is the best one. The others certainly have their uses, but if you really want to get the most out of Dante, you want to go for that 5 hit combo pretty often. 
It works out really well then because that one is the most difficult one to get since you have to time it between the other two, so your reward for timing that correctly is you get a bit more power out of it. Similarly, the last hit of each combo is the most damaging and inflicts knockdown because it's your reward and your incentive to finish combos in the first place. I think those things are intentional and they're a clever way of balancing out Dante's moveset. Finally, the thing that's great about all of this is you have so many different attacks with just a single button. There's directional inputs as well of course, but with that one button you can do a 3 hit combo, a 5 hit combo, a stabbing combo, you can launch the enemy into the air, you can launch and follow them into the air, you can do stinger, or you can do round trip. So you have all those distinct options and none of the inputs feel like they clash with each other. Sometimes the camera can be responsible for you doing a stinger when you wanted to do high time or vice versa, but it doesn't feel like it's the fault of the combat system itself, which is really well thought out. This boss fight can go one of two ways, the easy way or the hard way. I'm going to show you the easy way. Even if you do it the hard way, it's still arguably easier than the earlier encounter though. What you want to do is position yourself in the center of the arena and avoid Phantom's line of sight as much as possible. If he turns three times without being able to see Dante, then he jumps into the air and tries to land on Dante. Taking advantage of that, if you stand in the middle and get Phantom to jump several times, the glass ceiling will shatter underneath him, killing him instantly. It's been so long since I initially played this game that I can't remember if this is something I discovered for myself. I get the feeling that maybe somebody told me or I found out some other way, but there's definitely hints in place to help you figure this out. When Phantom lands on the glass, some little shards can be seen flying outwards and it gradually starts to look weaker with each hit. The cutscene here also plays out the same way no matter what you do, so if anything it makes a lot more sense when you use this method. Even though the gameplay is quite simplistic, there's a certain sense of satisfaction in using your brain to defeat the boss like this. You're working smarter, not harder, which seems like the kind of thing Dante would do as well. I can certainly sympathise with anyone who feels this is a cheap strategy, but the nice thing is you're not forced to use it. Even though it's technically the optimal way to beat the boss, the S rank requirements on this mission are balanced with a regular battle in mind. So if you'd rather just fight Phantom the normal way because you find that more interesting, you can go ahead and do that. You're not punished for it. All that's left now is to open up the drawbridge and finally leave the castle. To do that I'm going to have to use the trident I pick up here. This really feels like one of the holdovers from the Resident Evil days where you would pick up various weird items and use them to solve puzzles with, but if anything it fits better in the world of Devil May Cry. It's easier to imagine that all these crazy pickups would be sitting around in a demonic castle than the relatively more realistic world of Resident Evil. This time around, the items are just glorified keys, it drops any pretense of puzzle solving. Anytime you get a prompt up on screen, you can just select yes, it's always the correct option. At first it might seem pointless that all these different items essentially do the same thing, but the alternative really isn't any better. Player progress through the environment was always going to be gated in some way, and the alternative really is just giving Dante a load of keys. Given the choice between Dante going around with a ring of keys like Castle Maintenance or a bunch of magical items, I know which one I ultimately prefer. There's also the benefit that each key, as it were, has a different shape, so the player gets a better idea of where to use it once they pick it up. When you pick up a trident, it's pretty easy to connect that with the three-hole mechanism that you saw earlier on. For an action game like this, you don't want the player to be confused about where they're going or what door they can unlock next, so that really helps solve that problem. I'd say there's a decent chance the items just made it in because the team had worked on Resident Evil before and that's what they were used to, but it ended up working pretty well regardless. Since you normally get the Ifrit gloves on this mission, now's probably a good time to talk about them. Ultimately I think Alistair is the more versatile and enjoyable weapon, but the Ifrit gloves are unequivocally better against some things like Frosts, Nightmare, and most cases where you want to deal heavy damage to a single target. The damage output is mainly better because they have charge attacks instead of pause combos, which doesn't lead to as much variation as Alistair, but it's just a different way of again getting the most out of that single attack button. Thankfully, charging up an Ifrit attack also pauses the timer on the combo, so players aren't punished for trying to use Dante's full moveset. 
that sounds like an obvious thing to do, but I recently played a game released over a decade after Devil May Cry where the combo dropped any time you tried to charge up an attack. Once I noticed that, I just stopped using those moves altogether, an entire gameplay mechanic wasted because they didn't make that small change to the scoring system. I'm guessing that's also the main reason why Ifrit attacks can't be held indefinitely, otherwise they could have been abused to artificially extend the length of combos by just waiting around in the charge animation. While I might prefer one over the other, I found during this playthrough that every single move you can purchase for both Alistair and Ifrit is incredibly useful at at least one point. They both earn their place and feel very distinct from each other even though some of their moves are functionally quite similar. Clock off, Featherface. Or you can stick around and find out the hard way. Interestingly, you can skip this fight altogether if you're on New Game Plus like I am. The only thing locking you in is a door at the back which has one flame lit, you need to light the other one to open it up. You're not expected to have the Ifrit gloves, but since I do I could have just lit the flame and walked straight through. As far as I'm concerned though, it's one thing to kill Phantom in a clever way, and another thing entirely to just skip past the boss before it even has a chance to happen, so I'm fighting Griffin as intended. Griffin is very different from the other bosses because you end up dealing the majority of damage to him using guns. You're gonna see me firing Ebony and Ivory quite a lot over the next few minutes, and keep in mind every single shot has to be fired manually. In other words, every single shot is a separate button press. Given the huge amount of health that Griffin has, it can be pretty tough on your wrists, especially if you practice him a few times in a row. Even so, despite the vast, vast number of bullets you can fire in a single playthrough, each shot still somehow feels powerful and satisfying in its own right. The way they accomplish that is just with good use of effects, and I don't think there's any better way of explaining it than just breaking it down. Every shot from Ebony or Ivory will trigger the following. A powerful sound effect for both the shot and its impact, which is probably the most important part, but also a flash of light around Dante, an explosion sprite at the end of the gun, a recoil animation on Dante's hand, a rumble on the controller, a hit reaction from the enemy, in this case Griffin's head will twitch, his health bar will shake, as well as blood and feathers appearing at the point of impact, and last but not least, a shell casing will fly outwards from the gun, impact with the environment correctly, and make a sound effect every time it bounces off a surface. Again, just to stress this, every single one of those effects happens for every single gunshot, which is why they feel so satisfying. This doesn't just apply to the guns by the way, it's something they nailed in general. A more common example is the screen shake effect on certain attacks which emphasises the power of the impact. Little things like that can really make all the difference. Imagine you were put into a room with two versions of Devil May Cry where the gameplay is identical but one has all those little gunfire touches and the other just has the bare essentials. It's obvious which version the vast majority of people would prefer. All the special effects in the world can't save poor gameplay, but thankfully that's not a problem here. The attention to detail extends down to the gameplay itself. I think when it comes to action games like this, it can be easy to overlook how important those aesthetic considerations are though. Don't get me wrong, the gameplay is by far the most important part, but it's only through those other aspects that we feel what kind of impact we're having on the game world. In some cases, the way those effects make us feel about the actions we perform can be the difference between a good game and a great game. Even such a heavy action game as Devil May Cry is more than just the raw culmination of its gameplay mechanics. There's a lot of other work that goes into making it enjoyable to play. It's not just taunts and charge attacks that change the way the style meter works. During Griffin, it's relaxed somewhat to accommodate the fact that you're very reliant on your guns against him. The only ways to build style with the pistols are to juggle with them, charge them up or use Devil Trigger and that's the same as usual here. The difference is what happens afterwards. Most of the time when you just shoot them your combo will drop, presumably because they didn't want players getting stylish rankings by just shooting enemies from across the entire stage, but that's not necessarily the way it had to be. During this boss you're allowed to maintain your style just by hitting Griffin with regular shots and it works as a nice middle ground. I think, theoretically, if you were very careful about when you used your Devil Trigger, you could carry a single combo through this entire boss fight. This also applies to Shadows by the way, so even though I said earlier that they aren't a good example of style, there was at least some consideration put into how players would maintain combos against them specifically. 
You would think with the more permissive style meter it should be easy to maintain a combo against Griffin, but it can be harder than it first appears. Ebony and Ivory are normally hit scan weapons, in other words they hit their target on the same frame that the shot is fired. That may not be entirely true because there seems to be a delay of a few frames sometimes if there's a larger distance to cover, but either way it's close enough to instant. Going into Devil Trigger changes them to projectiles instead. The bullets are still fast, but they have a travel time, which means they have a much greater chance of missing, so if you're not careful about which method you use to shoot Griffin, he can end up dodging your shots. Even though Devil Trigger might at first seem objectively superior, that small drawback is enough to make it so that not being in Devil Trigger is sometimes the better choice. It's amazing what an impact such a seemingly inconsequential mechanic can make. If you really want to maximise your combos against that boss, you need to be paying attention to that small detail and plan your attacks with that in mind. This is the only boss encounter where you're forced to fight some basic enemies afterwards before the mission ends. It may not look like much, but it can be surprisingly easy to take damage here. In fact, at one point I got through the boss unscathed, came in here and lost my entire health bar. After a lengthy boss fight, it can be very tense knowing that there's still more to do before closing out the mission. That isn't necessarily a bad thing though, in fact I think it can heighten the amount of pressure the player feels. For the most part, the game seems content to let you relax after a boss, which is fair enough, but there's something to be said for exploiting that heightened sense of awareness you get after a difficult battle. One way the game does build tension is a little trick played with the health bar. A lot of the time when you take damage that would normally kill Dante, the health bar empties out entirely, but Dante stays alive. It effectively gives the player a second chance by just pretending that they narrowly avoided death. I think we've all had that moment where you're down to your last pixel of health and suddenly you start playing 10 times better than usual. That little addition is a way of forcing those times to happen more often than normal. It's a really brilliant little touch because it simultaneously makes the game more exciting and more forgiving, although admittedly it loses its effectiveness once you know the trick. Sorry. It goes without saying, but you won't be seeing any of that in this playthrough. Still, I thought it was worth mentioning because it's something almost every player will experience at least once, whether they realise it or not. This area is described as a labyrinth, but really it's more of a gauntlet once you know what you're doing. I get the feeling it may have been inspired by the Lost Woods from The Legend of Zelda. The concept is very similar, although it's altered a bit to suit a more action oriented game. The blue orbs might be taken as a more overt Zelda influence as well, they function identically to the pieces of heart you'll find in those games. The very first area you control Dante also reminds me of Castlevania, where you get a quiet moment to learn the controls and maybe find a few items before going inside, and obviously the whole setting bears some resemblance to those games as well. Even one of the first enemies you encounter in the very first Castlevania is a shadowy black panther. If you're willing to reach a bit deeper, you might even start to question whether or not it's a coincidence that the item which makes Dante invincible is a yellow star. Without insider knowledge, it's hard to know for sure where the inspiration for those things comes from, and even then I don't necessarily mean that they were an intentional effort to replicate something from other series, just that the idea may have been planted there by playing them. In the same way, I don't necessarily believe that Devil May Cry was consciously moulded by arcade games, just that it's easy to see where it carries on their spirit. This is one of the things that sets Kamiya apart from many other famous game directors. Often when you read an interview with a designer, and they get asked about what influences them or inspires them, they'll start talking about some books they like or films they admire. Maybe I'm not giving them enough credit, but I think at least part of it stems from some notion that games should be influenced by so-called higher forms of art. Almost as though it's embarrassing to admit that games themselves could be your main source of inspiration. Kamiya, on the other hand, will often just list off a bunch of classic games that he continues to play. Instead of shying away from them as an influence, he embraces them, and that's probably a large part of why Devil May Cry was able to push the action genre forward in the way it did a pure respect for solid gameplay mechanics, and one or two pilfered ideas along the way. This mission is very dense with action, and because of that it highlights one of the restrictions they had to design around. Enemy encounters are constrained to a single type of enemy at a time, almost certainly because of memory limitations. The only exception are marionettes and fetishes for obvious reasons. 
At the risk of sounding oblivious, I have to confess that this is something I didn't notice or care about before I started working on this commentary. The enemies are so well designed that it's not really a problem. Generally, the benefit of mixing multiple enemy types is that they can fill different roles. One might attack up close, while another is long range. That forces the player to prioritise them and consider their positioning more carefully. Game Design 101. They had no such luxury in Devil May Cry, so they built the enemies to compensate. It's not a coincidence that the majority of them have at least one ranged attack. The puppets can throw their weapons, shadows can turn into spikes, plasmas can shoot lasers or shockwaves, blades can fire their claws, and so on. Even though there's only one type of creature on screen at a time, their abilities are diverse enough that they're often fulfilling different roles. In an ideal world, of course it would have been nice to fight some combinations for a change, but thanks to clever design, the game really doesn't suffer much without it. Death sides are only ever encountered one on one, which allowed me to formulate a rather unique strategy for killing them. It turns out that one of the best things you can do against these guys is just stand still. They always have the same movement pattern before they attack, coming in close then flying directly upwards, so they end up being quite easy to dodge. The downward slash you can use while jumping gets extra damage if you use it after an air hike, so just four times is enough to kill one. I think they were counting on players to panic a little, or at least move around during these encounters, which makes it much more difficult to read the death size movement. Standing still might look strange at first, but it actually seems fitting for Dante and the game in general. Often you can find tricks or strategies that will make things much easier than they initially appeared. Often, but not always. If there's a trick to this next encounter, I couldn't work it out. For the most part, the game seems designed with no damage play in mind, but unless you're willing to run past everything, this area seems impossible to get through consistently without getting hit. In fact, I had so much trouble here that this is the only section where I resigned myself to swapping out the guns. I will be swapping again later to demonstrate some stuff, but here I do it because I just couldn't find any other way. The space is so tight that jumping is useless for avoiding damage, and there's so many blades that even a full Devil Trigger gauge will inevitably run out before they're all dead. Once I get into a good position, I swap into the grenade launcher so I can build up Devil Trigger again for round two. I could be firing the grenades faster, but that's not the best thing to do here. The grenades will knock the blades down, but they can't be knocked down again if they're already in a knockdown state. It turns out that the time it takes Dante to fire two grenades is almost exactly the amount of time it takes for a blade to get back up, so if I just keep firing, I can keep knocking them back down. It's not a particularly flashy tactic, but the alternative was skipping them all together, which I wanted to avoid if possible. The Devil Trigger gauge is really more than just a panic button the player can use if they get in trouble. When you start playing more efficiently, it ends up linking separate engagements into a larger hole. Granted, that relies on you knowing what happens next, so you can plan ahead, but they were definitely hoping people would want to do several playthroughs anyway. In other games, the Devil Trigger equivalent might be a mana pool, or some powerful spell that goes on cooldown, both of which can be easily exploited just by waiting for them to recharge. In another game, it might be a smart bomb that you can pick up in certain places, which is very restrictive. The way Devil Trigger builds by attacking, or taking damage, is a lot more suitable for Devil May Cry, and leads to more complicated decision making. It might not sound like much, but it's something I had to consider pretty carefully when I was doing this playthrough, even sometimes across separate missions. I didn't get a chance to mention it earlier, but these boss fights with Nero Angelo have phenomenal music. It's a quintessential boss tune, with piano, organs, a choir, an electric guitar, and synthesizers all rolled into one. This track is only a little over a minute long, but there's five distinct phases to it. After the introduction section, it moves forward every eight bars, so there is very little repetition. What makes this one stand out from the rest is the use of the organ and its pace. The organ kicks in whenever Nero Angelo appears, so we associate it with his presence. 
Each section of this track tends to start out sounding like a regular Devil May Cry battle theme, which then gradually gets overpowered by the organ. Once that happens, the underlying music adjusts until the organ rises up again. It's pretty easy to see how this represents the two characters in battle. Dante counterattacks or repositions himself and has a moment of relative safety, then Virgil powers back up and attacks again. Of course, that may not be what's actually happening in the gameplay at that particular moment, but that's where the fast pace comes in. Often when we're in the middle of a boss fight, we're too preoccupied with staying alive to really focus that much on the music, so if it doesn't fit what's happening on screen right now, it's not a disaster. Since the music is designed to match the boss, there will inevitably be points where, just by chance, the music and the action on screen will line up very well. Maybe Nero Angelo teleports away to taunt or fire a projectile, and the music just happens to get a little quieter at the same time. Those are the kinds of moments that tend to stick in our memory afterwards. By having the music undergo such drastic shifts at such a rapid pace, the likelihood of those little happy accidents increases. Of course, there's a lot more goes into good music than just the pacing of it, but I think that's one reason why this particular one works so well. I think this is the best fight theme in the game, but the others are great too. I'm particularly fond of the mid-boss theme, which sounds like a bunch of air raid sirens. Maybe that's where Air Raid gets its name from. The soundtrack in general has a lot of merits, and not just when it comes to the combat. The atmospheric castle track is really unique. The dissonant piano chords in the foreground sound very sinister, but the background is the more interesting part. It's like a string orchestra that's been dulled, so it sounds like it's coming from the other side of a wall. It fades in and out too, so you can never hear the full melody. It's a very strange effect, not the kind of thing I've heard before or since, but it really gives the impression of something evil happening elsewhere, just out of sight. Even now, the setting and the tone they created is very unique for an action game. Probably not the kind of thing that would have happened had it not morphed out of Resident Evil. Those moments of relative silence and eeriness can help to punctuate the action that much more though. It's not necessarily a bad thing to have some quiet sections. The level design often feels like something out of Resident Evil as well. Lots of tight corridors that aren't an obvious fit for an action heavy game. This room is a particularly bad offender. It doesn't really seem designed with a boss fight in mind. There's lots of little bits of geometry to get caught on. I'm open to some interesting stage designs of course, but I think when in doubt, the best course of action for a game like this is to get out of the player's way and let the boss itself shine. If a game starts to shift its focus midway through development like Devil May Cry did, the level design can be one of the most difficult elements to change. It takes a lot of work to set up in the first place, and it's all supposed to be connected, so changing one area might make it inconsistent with the one beforehand, even if there is a loading screen between them. As a result, it's a little hard to find particularly good things to say about the level design, but they definitely did some things right. The environment generally does a good job of guiding the player, even if there are several possible paths. Outside the Colosseum, the lights on the ground change depending on where Dante should be heading, which some people might follow without even realising. It doesn't make much sense, but this isn't the kind of game that needs an explanation for everything. They do the same thing with the red orbs in several locations too. In the next mission you'll see a red orb placed in the water so that the player knows where they should be going and that it's safe to jump in there. They also do a good job of defining what objects you should be trying to interact with. There's always some kind of ornate decoration around an important item which draws your attention to it. Those kinds of considerations push the level design up to a decent standard, but apart from a few clever hidden areas you can jump to, it doesn't do much to excel. Thankfully, they get away with a few lackluster areas here and there because it's not as important in an action game as it is for many other genres. Still, I can't help but wonder how things might have turned out if they had a chance to design it from the ground up as Devil May Cry. We're coming up on the first swimming section now. Swimming is the I want to vary my gameplay and I have no idea how to do it last resort. In this case I wouldn't say it adds much, but it's not much of a detriment either, which actually means it's much better than the swimming sections in many other games. There's maybe 5 minutes underwater in an entire playthrough, so it's not particularly intrusive. They gave the blades some unique animations just for these parts, but I'm guessing the switch to first person is so they didn't have to do the same for Dante. It's a bit of a cheeky way of avoiding that work, but it's effective. I can't really blame them considering how well animated Dante normally is. If going first person here allowed them to narrow their focus, I'd say it was well worth it. You could be forgiven for thinking the team had been animating 3D action games for years, even though the genre really only got started at this point. 
if you watch the Ifrit gloves here, they're a very extreme example of why the animations work so well. When you charge up an Ifrit attack, the majority of the time is spent on the wind-up, and then the active frames are incredibly fast by comparison. The same is true to a lesser degree for Alistair as well, a slice takes about half as many frames as the wind-up. It's a little exaggerated, a little cartoony almost, but there's a reason why cartoons are the way they are. Animators have known for ages that the time spent between keyframes needs to be accentuated for the motion to come across as intended. That exaggeration gives the attacks a sense of weight and impact that they'd lack otherwise. For a game, that's probably the most important thing to get right, but Dante's animations employ a few more classic techniques as well. 2D animation often makes use of smears, where motion is condensed into an exaggerated frame. If you've ever paused an animated film and caught the character in the middle of an impossible contortion, you are in all likelihood looking at a smear. Those are kind of possible in 3D animation as well by stretching the character model, but that's usually reserved for games with certain art styles. It can look very strange if the characters or setting is otherwise realistic. Dante doesn't technically have smears as far as I can tell, but he does have weapon effects that achieve a similar feel. On Ifrit, there's a fire trail left behind after each attack, which gives the impression of a smooth motion, even if there's very few in-between frames. Alistair has a similar but more subtle distortion effect that accomplishes the same thing. The brain is very good at filling in gaps, so seeing that solid arc of fire is really all we need to imagine Dante's arm moving nicely along that path. Another concept animators use is secondary action, in other words a follow-up effect of the primary motion. In this case, Dante's coat acts as a secondary action. By trailing behind the main animation, it helps to reinforce the idea that he's actually moving around and having an impact on the world around him. Once you start looking for it, you might be surprised how many games have something similar on the player character. It's not a vital technique, but it adds a little touch of realism that makes the whole thing that little bit more convincing, and of course it looks more visually interesting that way as well. It's not just Alistair and Ifrit that work well either, the way Dante moves even when he's just using ebony and ivory is also quite impressive. There's a few different animations for his legs depending on what angle he's moving relative to his opponent, and his body turns a little in that direction too. His guns stay fixed on the enemy though, so his arms and shoulders reposition themselves to look natural. When he moves directly backwards, he also bobs up and down a little, like something you might see a lightweight boxer do to keep themselves agile. Without all of those details, Dante's movements would look very flat, but once they're all in place, he looks as though he's constantly adjusting himself. It gives you the impression that he's ready for anything. This boss arena is as bad as the one before, if not worse, more or less for the same reasons. There's a lot of clutter to get snagged on, which can be frustrating at times. My way of dealing with it is to manipulate Griffin into landing. The environment becomes less of a problem that way, and it's easier to deal damage since Devil Trigger shots hit more often at close range. Ifrit is the weapon of choice this time because Rolling Blaze is very good at dealing with the electric bird that Griffin throws out here. If you jump at the right time, you can deal damage to it without having to focus on it. As you saw, I did get hit by it, but interestingly it doesn't deal damage the first time it connects. You're only punished if it hits again shortly afterwards. I think the idea is that it can be used to get a better vantage point, but ultimately it's not that useful. Even so, it's an interesting concept which most of the bosses mirror in some way. They have some kind of attack you can turn to your advantage. With Phantom and Mundus, it's meteors you can knock back, whereas Nightmare can be shut down by deflecting several of its moves, and getting pulled inside offers some unique advantages too. The only boss without a similar mechanic is Nero Angelo, but even then you can parry his attacks, so maybe that counts. Reflecting Meteors is probably the best one because it rewards good timing with a large chunk of damage. It's exciting because the window between success and failure is so small that you can never be totally sure you got it right until you see the result. Mechanics like that are great because they increase the strategic depth without making the controls any more complicated. Plasmas have friendly fire on their lasers, so if you're clever you can position yourself in such a way that they kill each other. Shadows can be frozen in place by landing on top of their horizontal spikes, giving you a few free seconds to unload some shots directly into their core. Complexity tends to be focused around the player's controls, but increasing the number of ways to interact with enemy attacks is another way to boost the skill ceiling. 
Devil May Cry probably isn't the greatest example of that, but it has a fair amount, especially considering it was really the first game of its kind. Perfecting the whole game like this took me a while, especially because I wanted to work out all the strategies and stuff for myself. I think that's a large part of the enjoyment. Mentally I was marking off my progress by the number of missions completed, so getting a short freebie at the halfway point was a bit of a morale boost. The problem with that way of thinking is that completing this one minute long mission only brings me one minute closer to the end. The fact that it's counted separately really makes no difference. Sometimes it's best not to overthink these things if you want to stay motivated, and little did I realise how much worse the difficulty would get from this point on. Anyway, that line of thought really made me wonder why Mission 13 and 14 were split up from each other. It seems like they could have easily been combined together. These are the kinds of things that are easy to lose sight of when you know a game really well. Before making this video, it had been a very long time since I played this game, but I'd played it so much in the past that the whole thing was still very firmly lodged in my memory. That means I know what I need to do and where I need to be going at all times. I don't bother to read the text on the mission start screens anymore. It took me a while to realise that without breaking up those two missions, players may not know that they need to backtrack out of the ship. When it floods, that could be taken as an indication that there's more to discover, or you might at least think that you need to exit the ship a different way, so backtracking a couple of rooms isn't necessarily the intuitive course of action. Splitting the mission up makes that much more clear. It seems obvious in retrospect, but you need to keep in mind that the developers have been working on the game for years by the time it releases. If you think of some game you know really well, you tend to internalise information that isn't necessarily obvious. In my case here, I know exactly where to pick up all the items and where to slot them, but a new player isn't going to know any of that at all. It takes some self-awareness or a good playtesting session to see what you're taking for granted that maybe you shouldn't. To be clear, I'm not saying that all games should be designed for the lowest common denominator in terms of skill or intelligence or whatever. Devil May Cry was consciously designed to be a very challenging game, and that's great, but there's no reason not to smooth out those little bumps if the solution isn't intrusive. Splitting the missions apart barely impacts players who know what they're doing, and might save some new players from wasting a lot of their time. It keeps things moving forward, which is definitely what you want in a game like this. In this area you'll see me demonstrating one of the more advanced techniques which people call slash cancelling. Every time you finish attacking with Alistair, Dante has a fairly lengthy animation where he puts the sword back on his back. If you spin the analogue stick before that happens, Dante finishes the sheathing much more quickly. It roughly cuts the recovery time in half, which might not sound like much, but it makes a big difference, especially since the enemies haven't been designed with it in mind. The Sin Scissors are supposed to dodge away from you if you try to combo them with your sword, the idea being that you should use your guns, ideally the shotgun, instead. Since I'm just repeating the first slash over and over again, they don't register it as a combo, so they don't dodge as much as they're supposed to. Thanks to the increased speed of the slashes, they also don't have enough time to block anymore either, so they become quite trivial to deal with. It's hard to say for sure whether slash cancelling is entirely a bug or not. I have a hard time imagining how something like this snuck in totally uninvited. I think it may have been intentional to some degree, possibly just to make movement smoother after Dante finishes a combo. Whatever the case, I don't think the designers accounted for it being used in the middle of combat like this, otherwise they probably would have programmed these enemies a little differently. Nero Angelo is another good example. If you swap into Devil Trigger and use slash cancelling over and over again, you can rack up huge amounts of damage to him before he teleports away. Bugs can lead to lots of interesting and fun gameplay mechanics. Without a bug in Onimusha, we wouldn't have juggling in Devil May Cry. Since they're not intended, they can obviously cause problems though. If the designers aren't aware of some little quirk, then they can't balance the game around it, and balance is very important, even in a single player game like this. Balance makes it so that Nero Angelo is pushed away enough by a single combo that he has time to teleport out. That gives him opportunities to counter-attack Dante and turn it into an exciting boss fight. From here on out I'll only be using slash cancelling one more time to break some destructibles a little faster. 
It was very tempting to use it in a couple of other places, mainly the second part of Mundus, but I wanted to experience the level of difficulty that was intended, and I'm not sure that slash cancelling is part of that. I suppose what I'm getting at is I like little glitches that lead to smoother or more complex gameplay, but I much prefer when they're recognised and canonised as proper gameplay mechanics. Overall, this game has a very smooth difficulty curve, even on Dante Must Die, when things already start out challenging, it only gets worse from there, but it gets worse at a pretty steady rate. I wish I could say it's all good challenge, but some of it isn't. This next area would be hard enough just fighting three shadows at the same time, but the boulders falling from above are actually an even bigger problem. If there's a pattern to these things, I couldn't work it out, so I'm assuming that they're random, or at least have a random element to them. Sometimes if you jump to avoid an attack, a rock will appear at the wrong time and smash you before you have any chance to react. Keep in mind, Dante can't change direction in the air, so if your double jump is gone, you're pretty much screwed until you land. There are some safer areas inside the mountain, but they're very restrictive and the camera angles aren't good. Definitely not something you want when you're fighting three shadows at once. This is perhaps the only outright unfair thing in the entire game, but it's unfortunate nonetheless. I think that the more challenging a game is, the more care needs to be taken to ensure it's completely fair to the player at all times. Players should always have a chance to react, or at least plan ahead, so they're not relying on luck to get them through. Personally, I think that should apply to pretty much every game, but I have to admit that easier games can often get away with being more lax on that front. Frustration is multiplied by the amount of effort you put in when you play. Getting hit with something unfair in an easy game isn't ideal, but the player isn't likely to be taking it seriously anyway. In fact, I think that may be why the Beelzebub flies are barely present on the higher difficulties. They're extremely easy to kill, but it's also very hard to avoid taking damage from them because they move around insanely fast. Despite the fact that they do so little damage, and have so little health, they may actually be the least fair enemy type of them all. As the game expects more from the player, the player should also be able to expect more of the game, otherwise it's just not respecting the time and effort that it takes to play it well. To begin with, it might seem like the fairness of any given game can be objectively quantified using a few different metrics, and maybe it can, but I'm not convinced that's particularly useful. In the case of Devil May Cry, or any other action game, one way to start measuring this is to ensure that enemies telegraph their attacks long enough for the player to respond. In other words, the time it takes for a wind-up to finish should be greater than the average human reaction time. Using visual stimuli, that average seems to be around 250 milliseconds, a quarter of a second, so it'd be fair to say those animations should take at least that long. It's not that simple though. First of all, you need to factor in any input lag, which can vary from game to game, and any potential latency from the display. This was less of a problem when CRT TVs dominated, because they process inputs more quickly than modern TVs, which is one reason why some people still prefer them. There's also the potential for dropped frames, even in the most well-optimized of games, so even if a game is running at 60 frames a second the vast majority of the time, if it drops lower for even a moment, that reduces the amount of time a player will have to react. Perhaps that should be factored in as well, just to be safe. In reality, the true barrier for fairness is probably somewhere north of 300 milliseconds, and even then you probably don't want every animation to just take that long or they'll be predictable and tiring, so some of them should probably take longer. We could say then that as long as the game meets those criteria, it's fair, but it's even more complicated than that. Technically, I think plasmas are the worst for this. Some of their moves like lasers and high time are more forgiving, but their basic kicks and slashes connect only 200 milliseconds or so after their startup. There was an effort to make them more fair, because Dante's first slash connects about 100 milliseconds after starting, so the plasma equivalent is actually about twice as slow. The problem is it doesn't feel that slow, because the animations aren't strongly telegraphed. It can be hard to even see the attack coming before the sword appears. Blades are another enemy which, at least in my opinion, don't telegraph some of their attacks very well. Even though their basic swipe technically takes about 400 milliseconds to connect, it looks very similar to their regular movement pattern, so in reality you get a lot less time to react unless you're keeping an extremely watchful eye on them. Very hard to do considering they usually come in large groups. 
when I get hit by an attack from either of those enemies, it's tempting to say that the game is unfair, but there's nothing stopping me from using different tactics. Plasmas are relatively weak against guns, and using air raid against blades makes them a joke. In fact, several of Dante's attacks like Inferno and Vortex are so powerful that I feel guilty any time I use them. The balancing probably isn't as tight as it could be in that regard. The problem then, is if a game has given you a tool that can destroy an enemy very easily, by definition that enemy can never be unfair. To think of it another way, plasmas could be invulnerable to everything except guns and they'd still technically be fair, much like a certain other enemy. So even though that objectively answers the question, it doesn't help to decide whether that actually makes for good gameplay. Marionettes have a near instant grab they can use if Dante is positioned in front of them, which obviously flaunts our little 300 millisecond rule, but it's hard to classify it as unfair for similar reasons. Lots of enemies in those beat em ups I mentioned earlier would work the exact same way. The idea was never to avoid all of their attacks as they happen, it was to put yourself in a position where you never had to do that in the first place. In the case of marionettes, you could keep your distance, get behind them, or inflict some hit stun to stay safe. As long as you play a certain way, there's no problem, but that justification is a slippery slope which restricts the player's freedom. For example, Dante's jump takes a little over half a second to complete, which means most enemy attacks can start and end before Dante even hits the ground. That can easily happen with the spikes shadows send from underneath, jumping straight upwards in the presence of a few shadows is incredibly dangerous. Once you know what to do, you can easily work around all of their quirks, and you might even say that makes the combat more tactical, but hopefully it highlights my point. If the player character is in the middle of an uninterruptible action, then the player can't respond to enemy threats even if they see them coming a mile away. Allowing defensive measures to interrupt any other action makes it easier for game designers to ensure fairness, but obviously it doesn't mean this game is unfair just because that's not always possible. It simply means that enemy placements and their AI needs to be more carefully considered so that they never overwhelm the player with an impossible scenario. Taking down Griffin up to now hadn't been too bad, so I was pretty confident going into this fight that it'd be relatively easy. That confidence was… incredibly misplaced. You can expect the bosses to gain new moves as you progress, but with this third phase of Griffin his most common attacks are also subtly more difficult than they were before. The lightning he fires closes in on you faster, which can really mess up your timing if you got used to how it was earlier. You'll see as well there's a little electrical orb thrown in for good measure which means I can't just jump up and down anymore, I have to move side to side as well. His new move for this fight is like a laser grid which is also very punishing, the only way to attack him while he's doing it is to try to walk through the gaps rather than roll through. It's possible but I couldn't manage it consistently so I went with the safe option. Given the fact that I've already taken off over a third of his health, you might be wondering how bad this fight could possibly be, but the health bar here is a bit tricky. You don't do the same amount of damage after the little cutscene, and I'm not sure, but I think it gets even harder to damage him as the fight goes on. By the end, things get very tense, because it seems like Griffin should have died ages ago and you've been hammering the button for a long time, it's almost like an endurance test. I actually really like how tough he is to take down, I think it's easy to imagine that a boss might be struggling to stay alive the lower his health gets. It makes sense in a way. Maybe I'm the only one with this problem, but I think it's surprising the kinds of details you can easily overlook when you're playing more casually. I did more than my share of playthroughs of this game back in the day, and I had to play through twice recently just to reach Dante Must Die difficulty. Despite that, I don't think I ever even noticed that Griffin's attacks are faster until I got to this point where I couldn't just brute force my way through anymore. A lot of the time when I play games, I tend to just put in enough effort to get by, and I think the same is true for a lot of people. It's important to step outside your comfort zone sometimes though. Personally, I feel like one of the best ways to see the merits and problems with any game is to spend some time playing it better than you normally would, and a little time playing worse than usual too. If you experience those extremes, you often get a better sense of what works and what doesn't. In the case of this game, doing this playthrough really showed me how good the bosses are. I'd even go as far as to say that the boss fights are the best part, and actually I think that 15 years on it might still be the best boss lineup in any action game. 
One main reason they work so well is because there's very little overlap between them. Griffin exploits your ability to use guns, but Nero Angelo has fought up close, and Nightmare is a bit more like a puzzle. The only one that isn't so extreme is Phantom, but he's the introductory boss, and as you've already seen, there's some unique things about him too. Even though they're all very different, that variety doesn't come from them being scripted or anything like that. For the most part, they behave just like they could be a standard enemy. Phantom was even used as the basis for the Cyclops, and in a way, three of them kind of do return as enemies after their death, thanks to Nightmare. Even if Griffin was much smaller, you wouldn't be able to fight more than one at a time, because two lightning attacks together might be impossible to dodge, but the death enemies are only ever fought one on one as well. If a death scissors had more health, maybe it could be considered a boss fight. If Nero Angelo had less health, maybe he could just be a regular encounter. The line between the enemies and the bosses is pretty thin. I suppose what I'm getting at is they exercise the things you've learned so far. I find that the best boss battles act like a kind of test, making sure that you've been learning how to play properly. The ones in this game definitely fall into that category. There's a lot more that goes into making a good boss, of course. A sense of back and forth is important too, which is another thing they nailed. Griffin's probably not the best example since you chip him down over the entire fight, but even so it rarely feels like you're forced to be passive. With the others, you get clear opportunities to take chunks out of their health bar, which is very satisfying. As you would expect, the fights are also significant difficulty spikes, and everything is fairly telegraphed as it should be. In fact, I'd say the bosses are even more fair than some of the regular enemies, where the attack animations and audio cues are sometimes less distinct. Taking all that into account, I feel comfortable saying that the bosses in this game are good. A more controversial point is that you fight them three or even four times each. Since I enjoyed fighting the bosses so much and even found them to be the highlight, it didn't really bother me. In fact, I was looking forward to the missions with the boss fights more than the others, even if I'd already fought them. Their repeat encounters were probably a result of time constraints, so ideally the team may have wanted to implement a few more, but this approach isn't all bad. You get more chances to learn and adapt to the boss, and them unlocking more moves feels a little like they're adapting to you too. It gives the impression that they initially underestimated Dante, but by the end they're trying their hardest to kill him. Finally, taking them down after all that work is very satisfying. If I have a problem with this approach, it's that the second encounter with each boss feels the most like filler. To be fair, there is always something new in each encounter to justify it from a gameplay perspective, but I think the second Griffin and Nightmare fights could have been replaced with something else for that little bit more variety. The repeat fights don't bother me much, but I do think the pacing could have been improved with even just one more boss. This is my favourite cutscene in the game. Can't help but feel a bit sorry for Griffin seeing him beg for his life even though he was just trying to kill Dante. I get the impression the two of them could have even been buddies if things went a little differently. Like anything in games development, cutscenes aren't easy to make, so they should accomplish as many things as possible to maximise the value they get out of that work. That also just makes them more interesting for the viewer anyway. The same would be true of a film. Every scene should have a purpose, and if you can layer multiple things into it, then that's great. This scene accomplishes several things without any taxing animation. First of all, it kills off Griffin. Once it happens in a cutscene, we know it's permanent. Secondly, it shows how ruthless Mundus is, which establishes him as someone to be feared and hated, building up some stakes for what's obviously going to be the final boss. Thirdly, Dante gets his little speech, which fleshes him out a bit. This is the most consecutive words he speaks in the entire game, by the way. I counted, it's 66. And lastly, by the way Trish looks at him, we can tell she's being swayed by what he's saying, which comes into play later on. All in all, it accomplishes a lot with very little, and I like how it shows a different side to Dante, even if it is probably cheesier than they intended. For the most part, the plot is framed as a revenge story, and it's only now that we see Dante be genuinely heroic, at least to some degree. I will kill Mundus. Now, this is the most ridiculous thing I developed a strategy for on this playthrough. After finishing Griffin, you have to jump on this little platform in the middle of the arena, and this isn't the kind of thing you want to mess up after doing such a difficult boss, so I went to the trouble of figuring it out beforehand. It turns out if you stand at the edge of the blue ring, jump straight up, then jump forward in the air, you land on it no problem. I'm sure if you've played, you'll know how finicky it can be to land in the right place. 
Dante is very rigid in the air and only has two different jump heights, so you really need to position yourself carefully before takeoff. If I hadn't planned ahead, I might have fumbled the jump after all that work, which isn't a disaster by any means, but it just doesn't look cool. You can actually use a very similar trick in the courtyard near the beginning. There's a little dip in the floor, and if you jump right at the edge, you end up on top of the fountain. They might even be intentional guideposts put in there by the level designers, but it's hard to say for sure. Whether it's just happenstance or not, little environmental landmarks like that can make traversal much more consistent. It's incredible how many games have totally unsatisfying jump arcs or jumping controls. The ones in Devil May Cry are pretty poor for platforming because they're almost entirely vertical and have very little mid-air control. You can push Dante a little bit more forwards or backwards, but not much, and you can't change his direction unless you have an air hike ready. It's easy to focus on the traversal aspect, where the jumps sometimes fail spectacularly and say they're bad, but they're not designed for that. They're designed for the combat which makes up the vast majority of the game. You can already dodge from side to side pretty quickly if you want to avoid a vertical attack, so having a nice vertical jump arc makes it easy to avoid horizontal attacks. It complements the dodge very well as another defensive option and makes it easier to chase after airborne enemies. Some more mid-air control would have been preferable so those platforming sections would be less painful, but if you think about how crucial the jumps are when fighting the ghosts or the bosses, it becomes clear that they're very suitable for this type of game. Most of the time, if you're on full health, you won't see very many green orbs. They usually only drop if you've already taken damage. There are a few scattered around though, and some enemies have a habit of dropping them anyway. If you're on full health when you pick up a green orb, it counts as red orbs, which is a nice way of ensuring that they aren't useless if you've been doing well. It's only worth 10, which is a bit cheap, but I suppose it's the thought that counts. The design of the orbs themselves is almost certainly an homage to the Behilits from the manga Berserk. If you've read it, you should know how ridiculous it is that Dante eats them like candy. I think Kamiya gets a kick out of pushing the power levels in his games to insane heights. In the enemy files, the description for the frosts says that the air around their claws is below absolute zero. Not absolute zero, below absolute zero. That's the kind of mindset you're dealing with here, the kind that sees absolute zero and says that just isn't low enough. I'll admit it's a bit juvenile, but it's not like it's supposed to be taken 100% seriously. Despite how grim things may seem in Devil May Cry, it ultimately appeals to that inner child who just wants to be a badass demon hunter. Collecting orbs is an interesting feedback loop. I get the feeling the shop system was another thing inspired by some older games, although it's hard to guess which ones specifically since there's quite a few with similar concepts. I think it tends to be a double-edged sword. It's hard to imagine a flawless implementation of the idea. There always seems to be pros and cons. A lot of games fall into the trap of giving good players rewards which paradoxically make the game easier, often a health boost or something along those lines. Even if you're not particularly good at the game, the growth of your character can stifle your growth as a player because you don't need to try as hard. Devil May Cry does it better than most because you mostly get new techniques which expand the gameplay, so even if they make some things easier, you're at least getting some new goodies to play with. The downside to that is, the game can't assume that you have any specific upgrade because you may never have bought it, so the enemy design can't require you to use certain moves. On the other hand, you could say that ensures the designers have to create enemies with several valid approaches. If something has to be killed using certain methods, it becomes more like a puzzle and less freeform. You can also think of the shop as a kind of soft tutorial. If Dante had every move from the start, then the onus would be on players to go into the menu or the manual, look at his moveset and try everything out until they understand it. Even if you're one of the very few players who would actually bother to do that, you're probably not going to see the value in all of your moves right at the very start, which means you might forget them by the time they become useful. Unlocking them is very different. It's a novelty when you buy something new, and since you've invested some orbs, you naturally want a return on your investment, so you're much more inclined to try it out more thoroughly. For experienced players, that's not much of a benefit, although it might make repeat playthroughs a bit less repetitive since you can buy things in a different order. Thankfully, there's the inclusion of New Game Plus, so if the shop isn't something you're interested in, you can just replay with all the moves available like I have here. 
I think the crucial factor in whether a shop system is a good idea or not is whether the core combat feels like it's well fleshed out enough just by itself. If it is, then locking the extras away arguably has more upsides than downsides. After how much trouble Griffin ended up giving me, I was expecting Nightmare to be brutal, but it actually wasn't that bad. This first fight was a mixture of good and bad luck though, so I want to explain what's happening first of all. I could have hit the dials before the fight started, but it's difficult to build Devil Trigger since Nightmare steals it, so I use the start of the fight to fill up the gauge. After it's full, I want to activate the dials to really begin the fight, but I got some very awkward camera angles. It's not normally so bad, but I had to spend a long time jumping away from the little worms to stay safe. It can be tempting to try to keep the dials full for the entire battle, but that's not what you want to do. Turning your back to Nightmare while it's active is a bad idea, so it's safer to wait until it starts to dissolve before focusing on them. Here's my stroke of luck coming up though. You'll see Nightmare just shut down even though I didn't do anything to it, so I get some free damage in. I'm not sure what caused this, it might be a glitch, but it could also have something to do with luring Nightmare outside the seals on the floor. Maybe it's just a bug, but I feel like I could be missing something here because it's a surprisingly intricate boss. Nightmare has a very strict pattern that it follows. It'll use its little orbs to fire some small projectiles for a while, then it'll use one of its other attacks. It repeats that over and over again. When the orbs are out, you're on the defensive, and when it attacks, you get an opportunity to counterattack, so there's some very strict pacing. Which attack it uses depends on your position, so I move around to make sure I get a chance to deal damage to both cores. The reason I want to do that is because of how the cores work. There's two of them, one on top and one at the back. Every time you deal damage to one of them, it gets closer to shattering. They start off blue, but with enough hits they turn green and eventually red. If a core goes green, any attacks from that core become more aggressive. In particular, the ice beam becomes devastating because it can spin around as fast as it wants. If a core goes red, then it takes considerably less damage, about half of what you would normally do. All of that is bad enough, but the real kicker is that the core status persists between fights. So if I was to break one of the cores now, the next two fights would become a lot more difficult, and there's no way to fix it. Obviously then, you want to keep the cores blue for as long as possible, and if you play it right, you can do that no problem. Each core shatters depending on how many hits you do, not how much damage you deal. Because of that, it's important to use Ifrit instead of Alistair, so you can charge up your attacks and get the most out of each hit. Even if you're very economical with your attacks, the cores might still break before you finish the fight, so you also want to get grabbed by Nightmare and pulled inside. When you're pulled in, the hit counter on the cores resets. That's why I wait until I have it around half health before getting grabbed, just to make sure I don't accidentally break the cores. It's a pretty complicated situation, and you need to be observant to figure it out, which is why I referred to this as a puzzle earlier. Once you understand what you're doing, Nightmare really isn't that bad though. It's definitely the most predictable of the bosses. The first time you arrive in here and see the outline of Phantom, it's very imposing. You get an idea of what's about to happen next. Even though it's just a silhouette, it's very easy to tell that it's him, or at the very least a Cyclops. The enemy types all look very distinct from one another, which of course lends the game some visual variety, but it's useful for the gameplay as well. The more they stand out, the easier it is to make snap judgments about them the moment they appear on screen. As I mentioned before, you never fight mixtures of enemies, unless you count this bit right here, so it's not that important in this game, but distinct enemy design is just good practice anyway. The visuals should also ideally convey what the best way is to fight them. For the most part, the game does a pretty good job of that, but sometimes it's a little unclear. Frosts are obviously better fought with Ifrit, and you would think the same would be true of Plasmas since they're electrical, but actually Alistair does pretty well against them too. Shadows might be a bit confusing for some first time players, which I think could have been alleviated by forcing you to destroy the cat statue with guns. For the most part, the designs communicate themselves very well though. You get a rough idea of how much health each one will have, and what kind of moves they're capable of. Visually, they seem to take inspiration from all sorts of places. Nightmare itself bears some resemblance to the works of H.R. Geiger, lots of incomprehensible machinery and skulls. Sin Scissors are possibly inspired by the fates of Greek mythology. They're all female and tend to come in groups of threes. Although actually only Atropos used scissors, so maybe that's a bit of a stretch. 
Death Sides are obviously a very classical western depiction of death, the Grim Reaper, whereas nobody seem like a more eastern depiction of demons. Blades bear a resemblance to the hunters from Resident Evil, so I get the impression they were brought across from there. In fact, their description in the files implies that they already existed in Dante's world in some form, they've just been possessed by evil spirits. Considering how different they all are, I feel like the team might have had a bit more trouble with their design if the graphics were more high fidelity or if they appeared on screen together. You can imagine how some combinations might have clashed with each other. As it is now, it's an eclectic mix, but it works. The variety makes it easy to imagine Dante as a globe-trotting demon hunter investigating all sorts of supernatural cases, some of them linked to specific cultures or mythologies. Since they obviously didn't have a chance to show any of that, everything gets jumbled together on Malay Island. Falling into the water at the bridge would technically mean I would take damage when I didn't necessarily have to, so I use Vortex to safely cross the gap. As you can see, it's much quicker anyway, as far as I can tell it's the fastest method of movement available. Since it consumes Devil Trigger, you know you can't use it all the time, and you just have to hold a button to keep it going anyway, so it's not an annoyingly complicated way of moving a little faster like Stinger is. Traversal isn't as important to this game as it would be in a platformer, but if players are being ranked on time, you can be sure at least some of them will want to try getting that number as low as possible, which is why the speed of different movement methods becomes important. My time at the end here is just short of 10 minutes, so if I hadn't used that trick, I might not have got the S rank. It's almost time for another advanced technique, this time jump cancelling. I'll be doing it to the two fetishes at the start of this mission, which is why I swap out to the shotgun, it's the only weapon you can do it with. Jump cancelling allows you to stay in the air indefinitely by repeatedly leaping off an enemy. If you launch, shoot and jump at the right time, you can keep going higher for as long as you want, pushing yourself to the top of whatever room you're in. At first it might seem a little difficult, but there's a rhythm to it, with a bit of practice it actually becomes quite easy. This one is almost certainly not an intentional inclusion, it only works because a few different mechanics happen to collide with each other. My feelings on this are basically the same as slash cancelling, it's an interesting quirk, but ridiculously imbalanced. Unlike juggling, jump cancelling allows you to completely isolate yourself and your target from the rest of the battle by climbing all the way up to the skybox, effectively making you untouchable. Being in the air is much safer than being on the ground, so your airtime should be limited unless you're sacrificing something else to achieve it. If you don't have to worry about staying airborne, you can pick them all off one by one, no problem. There are better places I could have shown that off, but I started this playthrough for myself, I just wanted to see if it was something I could manage, and didn't plan on using things like jump cancelling at all. It was only when I got a bit further in I realised I better at least show off some of these techniques once to give a more comprehensive view of the game. Still, that's all the more reason to learn it and try it out for yourself. The Labyrinth mission is a great place to do it because you can get up really high. The frost introduction is easily the most maddening thing I ran into doing this playthrough, although it might be more apt to say it ran into me. If you do nothing here, Dante gets hit with the attack 7 frames after the screen starts to fade in. You take damage before you can even fully see what's going on, so you need to approach it perfectly. Unfortunately for me, I think I must have tried every other option imaginable before I landed on one I could do consistently. It turns out what you need to do is walk to the bottom left and jump shortly afterwards. I lost count of how many attempts it took me and it's not an easy thing to practice, you can't get it to happen again unless you restart the mission, which means quitting back out to the main menu. To put it simply, they went too far, it's excessively difficult for what it is. I'm focusing on this one because it nearly drove me to insanity, but in general the cutscene to gameplay transitions are actually pretty impressive, especially for the time. That won't come across particularly well in this video because I was skipping cutscenes. They don't count towards the in-game clock, but I had to do a lot of attempts to figure everything out so I didn't want to watch them every time. Most of the cutscenes you see in this video are spliced back in, so if there's any anomalies that's why, often it's a lot smoother in game than I was able to make it in this video. The best one is probably the initial phantom appearance where phantom attacks Dante and Dante leaps into the air. When it cuts back to the gameplay, Dante is already mid-jump and the continuity of that action makes the transition feel nearly seamless. 
The music is also carefully timed to line up with the visuals, which must have taken some coordination to pull off. Usually the enemy is the one that's in motion, something attacks Dante in the cutscene and the gameplay immediately follows on from that, but the effect is more or less the same either way. Some games still struggle to replicate how smooth that feels, maybe because they think it's too cruel to make players avoid an attack as soon as they regain control. Devil May Cry isn't the type to coddle players, and while the Frost intro might be a bit too harsh, most of the time those cutscenes accomplish exactly what they set out to do. The skeleton here looks like a dinosaur to me, but apparently it's supposed to be a dragon. There's no way to progress past it other than reflecting the projectiles it blasts at Dante. Before this point, it might never have occurred to you that these kinds of things could be countered at all, but now you have to figure it out. Once you're forced to do that, you might start thinking about other ways it can be applied, like with Mundus later on. Doing this part is what made me realise Phantom's meteors could probably be deflected too, so the game actually trained me on something I could use on an earlier part of later playthroughs. A lot of other games wouldn't have interesting enough combat or enemy design to make something like that possible. There needs to be several viable strategies you can use, that way the game doesn't necessarily have to train you on them all beforehand. Acquiring new knowledge and then applying it on the next playthrough can be very satisfying. Weirdly enough, if you have air hike, you can completely skip the little platforming section here. You would think since they went to the effort of setting up those invisible platforms, they would want you to use them, but apparently not. The room probably should have been made a bit taller so that a double jump wouldn't work, but maybe they just didn't have time to adjust it. Don't get me wrong, I like when there's alternate ways to accomplish the same thing, that's actually something I like a lot about this game in general. Usually if something is giving you trouble, there's another method for you to figure out. That said, just jumping past all those platforms feels a bit cheap and pointless. At least the cool lightning effect didn't go to waste though, it makes this area of the castle a lot more atmospheric and of course it combines well with the last Nero Angelo fight as we're about to see here. It's not totally confirmed yet, but this is likely the point where you'll work out that Virgil is Dante's brother, if you haven't already. I like how, even though you can only see his head, his hair is enough to characterise him a bit differently to Dante. You can tell Virgil is the more serious one. That doesn't stop him from taunting though. In fact, the very first thing he does in this fight is stand still and taunt. It's up to you what you want to do in return. It's interesting how something so minor can feed into your own version of the story that's happening here. If you taunt before Virgil, then he's just taunting you back, but if you taunt afterwards, then Dante is the one responding to him. Since this is the final battle between two brothers, I tried to taunt at the exact same time. That seemed the most fitting to me. This last fight with him is the biggest increase in difficulty any of the repeat bosses have. He has a lot of new spectral sword attacks and just generally seems more punishing than before. If you try to take him head on, he'll retaliate incredibly quickly, so you'll see I have to play very carefully. The best way to be safe against him is to jump, because his swings have very wide arcs, so even if you roll, there's still a chance you'll get caught in it. Thankfully, there's some invincibility frames at the start of a leap, so it works as a good defensive measure. If you've ever played a game where two opposite actions are context sensitive or require very similar inputs, you'll know how infuriating it can be. Even if you make a mistake and do nothing bad, it can be very annoying seeing your character do something completely different than what you intended. In this case, even if the player fumbles the roll input, they're still doing something kind of similar anyway because they get invincibility frames either way, so it's not a big deal. The flying swords have an element of trial and error to them where you can't be entirely sure what way they're going to behave until you see it at least once. There's an argument to be made that the same holds true for every enemy in every game ever made, but predicting a creature is a lot easier than predicting some floating swords. Still, the way they're animated does go some way towards mitigating that. You can kind of guess how they'll behave a lot of the time. There's just a couple of variations that might catch you out. I won't go to the trouble of explaining how they all behave since you can see me using the right strategy against them. If you just take one or two attempts on the boss to learn the swords, they become pretty easy to avoid. You can't do much to Virgil while they're happening though, so there's just a lot more chances to get hit in this fight overall. I'm not doing a particularly good job of it here myself, but turning on Devil Trigger at the right time can make things a lot more efficient. 
damage is calculated when each hit connects, not when it started, so you can charge up punches as normal, then turn on Devil Trigger right before impact for maximum effect. You might have also noticed that Devil Trigger has a small punishment for turning it off. You lose one rune each time you manually deactivate it. Those two things are related to each other. If that punishment wasn't in place, the ideal thing to do would be to toggle it on and off each time an attack hits, which turns the simple act of punching the enemy into three button presses. One to attack, one to turn on Devil Trigger, and again to turn it off afterwards. As it is now, doing that would waste four runes just for a basic Ifrit combo, so you're better off just letting it stay active the entire time. The alternative would be high levels of play completely revolving around activating and deactivating Devil Trigger constantly to get as much mileage out of it as possible. Technically that would raise the skill ceiling, but I think there are much better ways to accomplish that. And once you've figured it out, you'd feel like you weren't reaching Dante's full potential if you weren't willing to constantly spam that button and learn those timings. There's also a delay of about a second before you can deactivate Devil Trigger anyway, which makes it even harder to abuse, but also works in the player's favour to some degree. Since players will sometimes want to use it in a panic, they might be hammering the button trying to activate it as soon as possible. If there was no deactivation delay, then they might end up accidentally turning it off again, which would be very frustrating. Overall, Devil Trigger is probably one of the most tightly designed aspects of the entire game. There's just enough freedom for you to get a little creative with it, but the loose ends have been tied off to ensure that it's mostly better to use it for its intended purpose. Brief periods of heightened power at the cost of resource management. The second arena for Virgil seemed very haphazard, but this one is much better. There's not much in the way of clutter, and even the few little bits of geometry around the edges can come in handy for avoiding him when he sets the swords up around himself. If you ask me, that's his most dangerous attack, and he uses it on me right at the end, so if you keep an eye out you'll see how I duck into a little corner to avoid it. Generally the last fight with each boss has the best environment. For Phantom it's the roof with the quick kill option, Griffin gets the Colosseum, and Nightmare has a weird looking cave with all those symbols on the roof. It's the big window and the lightning that makes this one stand out, especially since Virgil teleports right in front of it for a dramatic effect. It definitely feels like this room was made just for this boss fight. Since you encounter each boss several times, the environment helps make it clear that this is your last battle with them, otherwise you might just think it's another regular fight. In this cutscene we find out that Dante and Virgil are actually twins, not just brothers, probably identical twins. I assume that means they inherited a roughly equal amount of power, so it seems likely that Virgil only lost to Mundus because he didn't have the other half of the amulet. At least that's my take on it. As you probably remember, because I made such a big deal out of it, the first time you encounter Virgil he nearly kills Dante, but seems to have some kind of inner crisis at the last moment, as though he was struggling against whatever had corrupted him. For this encounter his human head is in full view, which to me implies that he's also regained control of himself. That's just speculation, and it was likely intended to be open to interpretation anyway, but it makes a lot of sense. He probably knows it's too late for him to be saved, so this final battle with Dante could just be a test to make sure he's ready to take on Mundus. Dante isn't the only one to benefit here though, for Virgil this may be his only chance to die an honourable death and to escape being enslaved by Mundus forever. If you ask me, that makes this boss fight even better. There's more going on than just beating a bad guy so you can get past him. While I'm speculating on the story, one thing I noticed here is that Trish seems to be familiar with Virgil in some capacity. I'd assumed that she was made relatively recently to lure Dante to the island, but she might be much older than that. It's possible she even had some kind of role in what happened to Virgil and their mother 20 years earlier. Even if she wasn't around for that, Mundus might have used her to pacify Virgil to some degree since it looks like he never had total control over Virgil in the first place. There's kind of an uncomfortable vibe with Trish and Dante for most of the story, which kind of gets resolved by the end, but the implications for Virgil are about 10 times worse if you really think about it. Once I'm finished swimming I'll be fighting Nightmare again, which makes this the fourth mission in a row that ends with a boss battle. It depends what way you want to count them, but I'd say there's 12 boss fights overall. That excludes the brief encounters with Phantom and Mundus, which don't really exist for the sake of challenge. There's 23 missions in total, so the majority of missions have a boss. 
I think that's the arcade influence shining through again, but the pacing is very unlike those games. Arcade bosses tend to be placed at the end of each mission in a very predictable, spaced out pattern. In Devil May Cry, the mission introductions point you in the right direction, but they generally don't hint at any impending bosses. Because the game establishes early on that some missions end in bosses and others don't, you can never be entirely sure when one is about to appear, which makes them more impactful, I think. I suppose it really depends on the person what kind of feeling that will evoke, but at least there's a chance it will pull some sort of emotion out of you, which might not have happened if you knew from the outset that you'd be up against a boss. It might be a negative feeling, like fear or tension, or maybe in this case since you're on your fourth boss in a relatively short space of time, it might even be annoyance. It doesn't really matter what exactly it is, because the end result, after completing the challenge, is catharsis, which is what the designers are really aiming for. I think the role emotions play in game design tends to get overlooked outside of certain genres, but it's a useful thing to consider even for a relatively straightforward action game like this. If you're not emotionally invested in what's going on, then you can't be satisfied when it's all said and done. They're two sides of the same coin. I decided to show off all the repeat boss battles inside Nightmare, which makes these fights kind of long, but I've already covered everything I want to say about them, so I'm going to digress a little here while I have some time. Hopefully you've noticed by now that I'm actually playing the HD re-release of this game rather than the original. There's a pretty good reason for that, and it's not just that the visuals are a bit more crisp. Years ago, most of Europe and many other countries agreed to the PAL, PAL, standard for their TVs, which capped out at 50 frames a second. Japan, America and a few other countries used NTSC, which capped out at 60 frames instead. This unfortunately meant that Devil May Cry, and many other games at the time, released in PAL territories locked to 5 sixths of their original speed. To be clear, I'm not just talking about the frame rate. the events that happen in-game took longer in real time. On paper, it doesn't seem as bad as it really is. When you actually compare them, you can see what a massive difference it makes. It's like playing in some quasi-state of slow motion. The especially frustrating part is that displaying the game at the wrong speed wasn't the only solution to that problem, but it was the cheapest way to accommodate the alternate frame rate, so most companies opted for that approach. The release of the HD collection was the first legal opportunity for people like myself to experience this game at the intended speed without resorting to expensive imports. Thankfully, this version is very faithful to the original. The biggest change is that it's now widescreen. Most people likely consider that to be an unquestionably good thing, but it is worth considering the side effects. The way certain scenes are framed has changed, which probably isn't a big deal for this game, but it's technically not what the original team intended. If it had been developed in widescreen from the start, it's possible they would have tweaked some camera positions with that in mind. It's more than just an aesthetic concern though, it could have an effect on the gameplay too. You're now seeing more of the playfield than before, which might make some sections slightly easier than they were intended to be. You have to question then, if you beat this version on Dante Must Die, is that really the same thing as beating the old version, or does this one maybe not count for quite as much? I still much prefer the wider picture myself, but it's an interesting question worth thinking about. That aside, there is a genuinely big drawback in this version. The menus and some of the cutscenes are displayed in the old aspect ratio, which gives it an inconsistent look. If you were wondering why there's black bars on the side sometimes, there's your answer. The menus seem to have been made for a fixed size, and many of the cutscenes were pre-rendered, so it would have taken a fair bit of work to bring those up to the newer standard. With some time, it certainly would have been possible though, so it's a shame that the game leaps between two different shapes, and the cutscenes look much worse in comparison to the gameplay now. The original version will always exist, of course, but you know how it is. Hardware gets old and harder to obtain, so faithfully updated versions like this are a good way to preserve games into the future. Ideally, I think all games deserve to be kept alive for as long as possible. Nobody can say for sure what future significance some of them might hold, but we can say that this one has already been very influential, so if anything it deserves some extra consideration. I think they should have been given the time and resources they needed to upscale the menu and pre-rendered cutscenes as well. I suppose the danger is, whatever extra work they might have done to recreate those parts might not have matched the original vision, in which case I'd rather keep it as is. 
Long term, if this version had a few innocuous changes and then later it gets ported again with a few more seemingly harmless changes, at some point in that chain it'll eventually stop being a good representation of the initial game. Computer games haven't been around for long enough for this to be an especially big problem yet, but I worry about how future generations will experience classics like this. You might think that emulation is a viable alternative, but most emulators rely on a bunch of hacks to smooth out issues with individual titles. Don't get me wrong, they're still extremely impressive pieces of software, but they don't offer flawless preservation, and the only way to judge the accuracy of the emulation is to compare it to the original anyway. Apart from a completely perfect emulator, which itself is a huge undertaking that requires exponentially more power than the original system, the best way to ensure accuracy is to hand the source code to a talented team who can bring it forward to newer hardware. In other words, it's the copyright holder's responsibility, so we're all screwed. Anyway, some issues aside, ultimately I am glad for this re-release because at least now I can play it at full speed. Staying on top of enemies is the most obvious way to keep your combo going, but there is another way which I'll demonstrate here. At first, charging up Dante's guns might seem useless because you get very few charged shots considering the amount of time you have to hold the button beforehand. It's not a great way of dealing more damage, but as it so happens, you get just enough time to charge up another shot before the current combo expires. Probably not a coincidence. As you can see, once you get the timing down, that allows you to continue comboing using just the guns. Thanks to the travel time on the bullets, it'll only work on medium range targets, which may be one reason why these kinds of shots even have a travel time in the first place. If they were hit scan, you could use the guns to rank up combos over an infinite distance, which would defeat the purpose. You shouldn't be able to get to stylish just by standing on the other side of a massive room, there needs to be some kind of challenge involved. Unfortunately, I didn't figure this thing out until after I finished this entire playthrough, so I had to re-record this mission to show it off. You won't be seeing it anywhere else. It's hard to be annoyed at myself for missing this though. In fact, I think it's a good example of how deep the combat system is, that I was able to do an entire challenge run like this and still not realise that those charged shots are genuinely useful. It turns out there's a few different things you can do with them. First and foremost, they're a good way to initiate combat. You can build up a decent amount of points before you even get close to your target. Alternatively, you can use them as another type of gap closer. Walking slowly forwards gives you a lot more control over your positioning than just diving forwards with Alistair or Ifrit. You can also find a couple of safe areas to just rain charged shots down on helpless enemies, racking up easy combos without putting yourself at risk. All in all, it's just another option you have, to be used as you see fit. You can add this one to your homework list next to jump cancelling. As you can see, I'm swapping into the grenade launcher because it's time to demonstrate something else. People have all sorts of names for this technique, but I think dodge cancelling is the most appropriate. Whatever you want to call it, all you have to do to accomplish it is roll after Dante fires a grenade. The time it takes to recover from that is much shorter than the time it normally takes him to recover from shooting. Of the three advanced techniques I've showed you, this one is the most likely to have been intentional, or at least to have been discovered by the team before the game released. Firing the grenade launcher and then wanting to roll is such a common scenario it would have been easy to find. Interestingly, grenades build the style meter anytime they hit an enemy, which isn't true for the pistols or shotgun. If you stand still, the combo runs out before firing the next shot, but if you roll around you can build up the meter as normal. You could take that one of two ways. It could be taken to mean that rolling is the intended way to use it since it's the only way to build style, or it could be that you were supposed to be chastised for using the grenade launcher in the first place. If you don't roll, the game basically just tells you that you're dull over and over again. It seems much more likely that the cancelling is intentional, but I prefer my other explanation because I'm not a big fan of the grenade launcher. It's not something that springs to mind for me when I think of cool or stylish weapons, so I don't think its use should be incentivized like that. The way I see it, you're trading style for damage. Dodge cancelling is one of those things that seems to always be advantageous, but as you saw back in Mission 11, the last time I used the grenade launcher, I found an extremely niche scenario where it made more sense to stand still because the timing automatically kept the blades knocked down. 
technically that would have still been possible even if I did roll around, but I would have had to time the shots carefully myself, so it made more sense to stay put. If not for that very obscure use, it seems like dodge cancelling would always be the right thing to do after firing a grenade. Even if it didn't speed up your attacks, you get invincibility frames while rolling, so of course it's better to have those than not to have them. It's a bit more complicated to pull off than just shooting since you now have two button presses instead of one, but there's no decision to be made because it's virtually always the optimal choice. On the one hand, you could say that having to manually roll after each shot increases the skill ceiling a little since there's more actions involved, but on the other hand you could say that there's no reason why the player should be expected to do it themselves. If it's always advantageous to roll cancel, then maybe the dodge should have just been built into the recoil animation in the first place, or maybe that recovery just shouldn't be cancelable at all. I'm all for pushing complexity in gameplay, especially in games like this, but I don't think that complexity should arise from needlessly complicated controls. The decision making process is more important. That's why Dante's combos have decisions built into them in various ways. Alistair can branch into one of a few options midway, the stabbing can be shortened or lengthened and you can charge up round trip whenever you like. Ifrit also has a decision every step of the way. Attacking as soon as possible brings you closer to the end of the combo and might keep the enemy stunned. Holding your attacks instead gives you more damage and more style. You can even mix and match, do some drawn out hits and some short ones. A powerful combination is to do the first two attacks quickly and then the last two slowly since they do the most damage. Those decisions are what make the gameplay engaging because you have to constantly be thinking about which choice you're going to make. Depth really starts to appear when there's a viable, distinct alternative to each potential action, which is why I'd say dodge cancelling lacks depth, even if it is a cool little trick. Dante, help me. Trish. I think this cutscene would have been more effective if we hadn't seen before now that Trish is working for Mundus. I'm not really sure what was gained by having that knowledge before now anyway. I suppose it makes things a little more tense since we know something bad is going to happen, but it could have made for a decent enough little twist if the reveal had been left until now. It's not really this cutscene that's the problem though, it's the ones before it where we see things that Dante couldn't possibly know. I think for games with relatively simple stories it's usually best to just show us what the protagonist sees and let us experience the journey exactly the same way they do. This last nightmare fight is more of the same until the final phase, so I'm going to take this opportunity to talk about something more general again. One thing that really interests me is how restrictions on developers can influence the design of a game, sometimes for the better. Arcade machines often had scoring systems in place not dissimilar from the ranking system in Devil May Cry. In fact, the rankings are very reminiscent of the default high scores which would already be filled in. They gave players something to aim for, which was particularly important if the machine didn't have any non-volatile memory and it got plugged out, or the game got ported to a home system since it wouldn't be in a public place. Before the advent of the internet, a player might not have had anyone to compete with locally. The default scores were often insultingly low, but some of them proved a bit difficult to top, much like the S ranks in Devil May Cry. They act as an indication of how well the game can be played even if you have nobody else to play it with. If Devil May Cry were to be made today after the proliferation of the internet, there's a chance they might have just put in a scoring system with online leaderboards like a lot of later games have. Players could have competed globally on time or maybe the number of orbs they accumulated, which sounds kind of interesting but has its own disadvantages. According to Capcom, the original Devil May Cry sold over 2 million copies. Let's imagine there was some kind of automatic leaderboard that uploaded your score after each mission, and we'll even be conservative and say that only about half of players will play while connected to the internet. That leaves 1 million instead of 2. Now imagine that you try to finish the first stage as quickly as you can, and you do a great job. You manage to get into the top percentile of players. That means 99% of players completed the stage more slowly than you. The vast majority of other players were slower. That's pretty good, but thanks to sheer numbers, each percentile consists of 10,000 people. Even though you did that well, your performance only landed you in 10,000th place. You can see how that would be discouraging for a lot of people, even though it's an objectively outstanding result. 
something they should actually be proud of. Even if you were to practice that stage over and over and manage to crack your way into the top percentile of the top percentile, that would still leave you in 100th place. Only one person out of those one or two million players can ever really be completely, totally satisfied with their result, and even then they could be knocked off the top at any moment. The ranking system in Devil May Cry avoids that problem. Getting an S rank is a lot more attainable. Theoretically, every player can S rank every stage and feel equally good about it. You could say that not having those leaderboards is just hiding information from the player to avoid making them feel bad, but having that knowledge can change the way the game is played for the worse. The playthrough you're watching right now is far from optimal. I barely use the grenade launcher and I kill lots of enemies I don't necessarily have to. This way of playing appeals to me though. I think the pistols suit Dante the most and I don't like seeing him just walk past enemies. Other players might be more preoccupied with how quickly they can complete the game or seeing how many stylish combos they can rack up and that's fine too. If there was leaderboards we'd all be under more pressure to conform to a certain playstyle in order to compete with each other, whereas with the current system we're not pitted against one another. The ranking system pushes you to a certain standard of play but within that you also have some freedom to focus on what you like best. It ends up being a nice middle ground. Thanks to Trish, there's now another attack to dodge, and things are about to get a lot worse. The final Nightmare Core is one of the most hectic moments in the entire playthrough. The key to this part is realising that the core status doesn't matter anymore, since Nightmare will be dead soon anyway. That's why I swap over to Alistair, it's a lot better at doing damage safely. The core periodically fires a laser directly on Dante, so you need to constantly be moving back and forth, and carefully time the moments when you change direction. I'm glad this section doesn't last too long because it's very difficult to avoid everything even though none of them are particularly damaging. When you're doing a no damage run, there's no difference between a little chip off your health bar and something that kills you in one hit, so it really changes what parts you might consider difficult. That said, I do like this final phase, especially now that I've finished it. It's one of my favourite parts of this video, it's just a shame that it was kind of difficult to practice because you have to beat the boss every time you want to try it out. I'd say this might be the most important cutscene of them all, and thankfully it's pretty well put together. It's got some of the better animation and voice acting. I like how Trish reacts when Dante is running towards her, she thinks he's going to attack her. The way this whole situation plays out is pretty convenient for the plot. If Dante hadn't run at her, she might have been able to avoid the pillar herself, and if Nightmare's lasers hadn't spun around in that particular way, Dante would have had no reason to save Trish in the first place. Overall, he gets pretty lucky in this game, like when he needs to escape later and a plane literally falls on top of him. If the decision to save Trish had been in the player's hands, I think her odds of survival would have been a lot lower. Dante has more reason to save her than we do, he just doesn't want to see his mother get crushed to death. You can imagine if Devil May Cry was a different game, this could have been some kind of branching choice, where choosing not to save Trish is some kind of gotcha that puts you on the road to the bad end. It seems like some people consider games with branching story paths or multiple endings to be automatically superior than those without. I think the idea is that games which lack choice fail to take full advantage of the medium, which is actually something I agree with. Devil May Cry is absolutely littered with choice though. The story will always move from point A to point B, but how you get there is up to you. You get to choose how you're going to be stylish, what weapons you're going to use, when you're going to use your devil trigger, whether or not you feel like taunting, the list goes on and on. You make more decisions playing 5 minutes of Devil May Cry than some entire other games. If the price paid for that is letting Dante make his own choices during the cutscenes, then I'm more than willing to just let Dante be Dante. Being that we're now in the underworld, you can see the visuals have taken a drastic shift. 
I do wonder if they could have started over from scratch would they have taken a bit more influence from the Divine Comedy for this part. If Dante had entered the underworld sooner, we might have had a chance to explore some different areas within it. Something tells me an ocean of naked, writhing sinners would have been vetoed by the suits at Capcom, but the way Inferno is described gives the impression that each circle is very different from the last, so I can't help but wonder how that might have looked in this game. While it might not be a good depiction of Inferno specifically, it shows good planning that they saved this area for the finale. Even though they had to reuse some locations to get the length they wanted, those reused areas aren't just bolted onto the end, they're stuck in the middle instead. Some players who really hate backtracking might get less enjoyment from the middle of the game, but at least then it picks back up instead of just fading away. Really, a change of environment is one of the best ways to reinforce the idea of progress, and of course it's just nice to have something different to look at as well. On the surface, nobodies are the most intimidating enemy type because of their powerful counterattacks and their grotesque design, but as I'm about to demonstrate, they're really not as bad as they might first appear. If you do a launch on them, their feet won't leave the ground, but they're more or less in a juggle state anyway. The style meter even works the way you would expect if they were in the air, and shooting them resets them back to the start of their vulnerable animation, which means you can do stuff like this. Given how much trouble these guys can be, toying with them like this is pretty satisfying, although I do wonder why they don't just allow you to knock them into the air. It'd feel even better if they could be fully juggled. Nobody's have an annoying habit of dodging away from your attacks whenever possible. This next one dodges me several times in a row. The puppets have something similar where they'll randomly block attacks from the front. They tend to do it pretty rarely, and you can avoid it by attacking from behind, so it's not so bad, but nobody's dodge all the time. I can understand why it's valuable, because it makes the enemies more challenging and gives them more longevity, but it seems a little cheap to me, because it essentially punishes the player for doing absolutely nothing wrong. Sin Scissors are a better example of a similar concept. They always dodge once you start trying to combo them, but since it happens all the time, and the conditions behind it are clear, it's a lot easier to accept. It just feels like part of their design. When it happens randomly, without any discernible warning, it's a lot less enjoyable. In the third encounter, you'll see me using Round Trip for the first time. It's a very stylish move, but dangerous to use when there's multiple enemies around because it takes so long to charge up. It may seem impractical at first, but believe it or not, it's the most useful skill against Mundus, so you'll be seeing a lot more of it very shortly. These nobody battles really go to show why the enemies usually come in packs. Even the hardest ones aren't much of a threat by themselves. I mentioned earlier that Devil May Cry is a relatively short game, but that's not necessarily a bad thing. Even compared to other games in the same genre, it packs a more than respectable amount of enemy variety into its playtime. As a critic, I have an idealistic notion that games shouldn't be judged by their length. I feel it's better to appraise their quality by what they set out to do and how much of that they manage to accomplish in the time that they have. Length versus price is often used as a way of measuring value, which is more than a bit flawed in and of itself. In fact, I could probably talk for ages on that topic alone. Instead, I'm just going to dismantle that argument in the simplest, most easily understood way. Value changes over time. If you bought this game at release, it cost as much as most other PS2 titles, whereas years later you could get it cheaper in a package with Devil May Cry 3. So, if you ask me, it's just not wise to factor pricing into your assessment of a game from an academic sort of standpoint, but I have to admit that players and designers don't have the same luxury I have from my armchair position. Developers need to be aware that players have made some sort of investment to try their game, even if only the time they've set aside to play it. At least some consideration should be put into making sure that players aren't disappointed, and one of the best ways to do that is to help them set their expectations appropriately. The drastic change in environment in these last few missions gives the indication that Dante is getting close to his goal, but there are other clues along the way. Killing Nero Angelo and seeing Trish's betrayal should give you some idea that you're nearing the end too. The big door at the end of this mission is my favourite though. 
You don't actually have to wait for the animation to complete, but I like watching all the hands smash themselves. This is unlike anything you've seen up to now, so you can be pretty sure that the last boss is on the other side. If there was any doubt left, the pristine temple in the next area is an even bigger clue. Since you see it in an earlier cutscene, you know Mundus is there as soon as you walk in. This game got some flack for being short when it first came out, but without all those elements foreshadowing the ending, people would have been much more harsh. In the grand scheme of things, I don't think length really matters that much. You're unlikely to get the most out of this game on a single playthrough, but for some players that's all they'll ever do, so of course the narrative accommodates that. When it comes to the story, it's resolution that we're really looking for. As long as we get a good climax, we're usually happy. This glistening temple embedded in the middle of hell was a fun choice. Just because you're a bad guy doesn't mean you want to sit around and squalor. I can't help but feel obligated to show this cutscene since it's the final boss, but I've run out of things to say about the story at this point, so I'm just gonna... Silence! There we go. Kamiya is a fan of rail shooters like Space Harrier, so the abrupt change in gameplay here is inspired by those types of games. This is one of those places where the eternal debate about inverted controls rages on. For me it really comes down to how the character and the camera behave. If either of them pitch up and down significantly then I'm more likely to prefer inverted. In that case it makes sense that pushing forward tilts down and vice versa. In cases like this where the camera isn't moving around much, I've come to prefer uninverted because it feels more like moving a reticule around. The reticule just happens to be Dante. I initially found myself in some trouble here because the analog stick is inverted and there's no option in the menu to change it, but it turns out that the D-pad works as an alternate control scheme. I can't decide whether or not this is clever because in theory it saves you from having to go through the menu, but the most logical course of action for me was to explore the menu first, meaning I wasted that time anyway. Also the D-pad is obviously less flexible, so my movement is a little jerkier than I'd ideally like. Still, I'm glad that the option exists. Using the control scheme you're more comfortable with makes a huge difference. You might notice I'm liberally applying the golden rule of rail shooters, which is move in a circle. It won't avoid everything, but it's a good start. You just need to modify your circle depending on what's happening. Sometimes it's more of a square. There's a few tricks to this boss, but hopefully most of them are self-evident. One interesting quirk is that Mundus's wings don't have a hitbox, so you have to aim at his body. Also, the meteors he summons have some randomization to them. Moving in a circle isn't always enough. Once you figure out the best way to use Vortex and Devil Trigger, it only takes a couple of minutes to get through. While I might disagree with Mr. Kamiya about which movement type should have been the default on the analog stick, the control scheme here is otherwise well thought out. Every action you can perform corresponds to something in the base gameplay. The dragon attack works off your devil trigger gauge, so naturally enough it's mapped to that button. Shooting and vortex are activated as normal, and even the evasive movement uses the roll button. Without having been told anything about this mode, you can do everything you need to do just by relying on the controls you already know. Mundus has lots of well-telegraphed moves, and I've never run into a combination that seems unfair. All in all, it's a well put together segment, especially for something that only lasts a few minutes. The question is really whether or not a rail shooter section even belongs in Devil May Cry in the first place. One of the core ideas behind this game was to challenge people, give them something they can be proud of accomplishing, and one way of achieving that is to make players prove themselves at more than one game type. If there was another regular fight here instead, it might be impressive in its own right, but just another instance of the core gameplay which you've probably got a good grip on by now. Adapting to a different set of mechanics and overcoming them makes the playthrough as a whole more impressive. As someone who likes to play all sorts of different games, this is a mentality I can get behind, although I have to admit it can be detrimental if it's not handled carefully. In this case, I think the segment was well implemented and short enough so as to enhance the overall experience, even if you've played through many times. On a first playthrough, it adds a lot of flair to the final boss fight, and on the highest difficulty, it's a different thing you can feel proud of accomplishing.
There's a lot to explain about this next phase, but the most important thing really is positioning. The rocks that surround Mundus are one of the biggest threats because they can be shattered by a few different things, so when that's about to happen you need to be out of their way. It's best to stay away from them in general anyway, since they also act as a kind of shield for Mundus too. The next most important thing is to make sure you destroy at least one of the big orbs every time he brings those out. He eventually absorbs them and turns them into fireballs, which can be reflected, but if he has all four it becomes a lot more difficult. You get some Devil Trigger for breaking them anyway, so again, that's a good idea generally. Conserving Devil Trigger is important too. When I said earlier that damage was calculated on hit, I wasn't kidding. It even applies to round trip. You can throw it out, then turn on Devil Trigger afterwards, so you're not wasting it while you wait for that long charge up animation to finish. That alone probably saves several runes of Devil Trigger just by itself, which can obviously make a huge difference. The rest of the battle is really just figuring out the best way to avoid and deal with his attacks. There are some little quirks you can exploit which you'll see me using. The orbs he summons at the edge of the arena can't shoot inwards, so if you stand behind them you'll be fine, and the lava dragon can be killed in one hit by reflecting its attack. Individually, none of those things are really all that threatening. What makes Mundus unique is the way he layers his attacks on top of each other. The ones that tend to cause the most trouble are the small orbs. He has three different arrangements of them, but they all last a relatively long amount of time, so you often have to deal with them in conjunction with other things. In some cases you can be dealing with three or even four attacks at the same time. Mundus uses every move he has at least once during this fight here, but if you count them all up it only adds up to ten. You can kind of think of each separate combination as an attack in its own right though. The way you behave when you're just dealing with lava spires isn't the same way you'll behave when you're dealing with them and projectiles at the same time. There's often so much going on it can be a little hard to go on the offensive, but it's such an efficient and interesting way of putting the boss together that I'm surprised it didn't crop up during some other battles as well. I don't think every boss should work the same way, but the same principle could have been applied to others, at least to some small degree. Making a boss like this does present some problems though. It doesn't look like much when you're just watching, but when you're playing you need to keep track of so many little things that it can be hard to focus on Mundus himself. You can't always be watching him, which might be why he moves so slowly. If not for that, this whole fight would have been a lot more difficult, and probably more frustrating. I'm especially thankful for that because there's an issue with Mundus in this version of the game that wasn't in the initial release. He sometimes throws lava at Dante, which doesn't have a clear visual cue anymore. In this version it just looks like a slight heat wave distortion which can be hard to see whereas in the original it had a proper fire effect to go with it. Thanks to his slow animations you can still easily see Mundus winding up for it, so it's not game breaking, but you need to be more observant which can be kind of taxing because there's already a lot to keep in mind during this fight. This is the problem with preservation I was talking about earlier. First time players might think that the game always had this problem, and even as someone who played the other version I can't guarantee that there isn't more of these minor issues that I've overlooked. There are so many details in any given game it's very hard to verify they're all in place when remastering it, especially when, even late in development, bug fixes can break things that were previously verified as working. The final boss is an unfortunate place for one of those things to happen. Once you reach this difficulty it becomes immediately apparent that standing on the rocks and whacking Mundus in the face isn't going to be a viable option, but that's the way I used to kill him before, and I'm sure it's the same for a lot of other people too. When you attack him that way, this boss fight is a bit of a mess. If Mundus goes for a punch, the rocks can break out from underneath you with practically no warning, and lots of other things are more difficult to avoid as well. Ideally the correct way to approach him would have been better communicated because I found it a lot more enjoyable once I had to do it properly. Still, some people will always feel that a fight like Nero Angelo would have been a better way to close things out, and I don't really disagree. I prefer those types of bosses myself. Nero Angelo benefits from feeling like a more difficult version of the types of enemies you'd encountered up to that point. Just by that virtue it feels more like Devil May Cry because it's more like what you spend the majority of the game doing. Mundus feels the least like that of any of the bosses, it's very restrictive. That said, there's an undeniable level of spectacle to Mundus that the other bosses can't quite match. 
there is no mistake that this is the big finale. The best way to think about this is that it doesn't have to be an either or scenario. A game can have both kinds of battles and that's perfectly fine. The problem is they made the mistake of closing out Nero Angelo's arc a bit too soon. By the time you hit Mundus, Nero Angelo has been gone for a long time. If the two battles were moved closer together and framed a little differently, I think it would please the maximum number of people. Those who prefer the rival fights get some satisfying closure and then the spectacle at the end feels more like a bonus. Either way, it's all the same amount of content. You do get that final fight with Virgil and it is still enjoyable, but I can see how it might be even better if they saved it for closer to the end. This cutscene is infamous for Dante's melodramatic scream. I kind of just want to ignore it, but I suppose I wouldn't be doing a very thorough job if I didn't address it, so have a listen. My mother risked her life for me, and now you too. I should have saved you. Should have been the one to fill your dark soul with light. Light, 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 light. I think there's two main reasons why that line ended up the way it did. First of all, just from playing a bunch of other games, I get the impression that light and darkness maybe don't sound quite so ham-fisted in Japanese. I've seen more than my fair share of dialogue from Japan that's referred directly to the same stuff in a similar fashion, and only a handful of instances of it in English. In English, we tend to let light and darkness as a metaphor for good and evil be more of an implicit concept rather than just saying it out loud. That's why to a fluent English speaker this sounds like something nobody would ever say. It could just be one of those things where it sounds better in one language compared to another. I'm sure it wasn't helped by the very dry translation either. Secondly, and probably the bigger problem, is that it released in Japan subtitled with the English audio. In other words, they never recorded Japanese dialogue, so the team in Japan were likely overseeing the English voices. Unless you're fluent in a language, it's much harder to detect flaws in the delivery, so I'm guessing because of that they let through some things that they might have otherwise wanted to re-record. That's a lot of speculation on my behalf, but it's the explanation that makes the most sense to me. History isn't going to look back favourably at the dialogue in this game, but in their defence I just want to point out that this is brought to you by the same company that made Resident Evil, starring Jill Sandwich, the master of unlocking. It may not be great, but it's a huge step up from what they were doing just a few years earlier. I suppose how you feel about that will depend on whether you think games should be judged relative to others at the time, or against some kind of objective standard. The cutscenes in this game fare okay if you look at it one way, but not the other. Even though the statute of limitations has probably passed by now, I'm not going to throw out any spoilers for other games in the middle of this video. That said, it is worth saying that the ending sequence to this game bears more than a little resemblance to the ending of another game that released just a few years beforehand. Let's just say there's another game where you defeat one form of the final boss, escape a crumbling castle before a timer runs out, meet the final boss again, and finally destroy him with the help of your female companion. There's a decent chance you know what one I'm talking about. That type of ending was good then, and it's good now. Beating the final boss, then getting kicked directly into cutscenes can feel a little anticlimactic, even if the boss is very good. It can feel a bit like the character gets to celebrate their victory and you don't because you're not in control anymore. Even though it's on a timer, this sequence is really a chance to start winding down. You have plenty of time on the clock, and you're mostly fighting things one on one, which you should be well able for by this point. It's a bit like a victory lap, going back through all the things you've conquered. The music helps to reinforce that idea by playing a single track for this entire mission. Dante has already defeated Mundus, so it should be obvious by now that nothing else on Malay Island stands a chance against him. 
fighting the enemies here should feel like playing a JRPG and bumping into a random encounter that's 20 levels lower than you. You probably don't want to hear the first 6 seconds of the battle theme again for the millionth time. It's not enough to compose great music for a game, it's also a matter of knowing where and when to use it. The soundtrack gets a bit strange after Nightfall because some areas lack music completely and even the later battle themes are more subdued. It verges more on the oppressive horror aspect as Dante tries to reach the underworld. Once you get to hell it feels like taking the fight to the enemy so the music starts to pick back up and for this final stretch it's more or less back to normal. In other words it goes on the same journey that Dante does. Just like the rest of this mission, this fight is more or less a formality, although you don't necessarily know that the first time you get here. On your first playthrough, it's possible you died a whole bunch of times to Mundus before you finally managed to best him. As a player, that's very satisfying in its own way, but it's maybe not the best note to finish up on. Since it's so easy, this part is a chance for most people to beat Mundus on their first try, or at least I think that's the idea. I was surprised the first time I did this bit on Dante Must Die because the health boost makes it considerably tougher. I actually ended up running out of room and getting killed, that's why I've saved up Devil Trigger for this point. As usual all you need to do is just use up as much Devil Trigger as you can and then build it back up again. Mundus only has a few attacks here anyway and they're pretty easy to avoid. Without this little fight, escaping at the end wouldn't have been as climactic. Seeing Mundus again builds up some tension, especially since he looks so horrific this time. It's the release of that tension that makes the escape feel satisfying. Mundus makes a jab here about Dante's weakness as a human, but it's ultimately his humanity that saves him. If he hadn't saved Trish earlier on, she obviously wouldn't be returning the favour now. It's been established from the very first cutscene that demons are capable of doing the right thing. Sparta woke up to justice, and now we see the same thing happening with Trish. Dante is kind of another example as well, even though he's part human. If Devil May Cry has a theme, this is probably it. It doesn't matter what you are, it's what you do that counts. It's not the most original message out there, but I kind of like that a game with a dark exterior has such a warm and cheesy interior. It looks like we have a winner. Jack. Goodbye, and when you do come back, give my regards to my son, will ya? This plane bit is by far the most difficult part of this mission to avoid damage, which is especially unfortunate because there's no way to practice it. You have to go through the whole mission every time. Generally this is more about timing shots well than moving around, but you'll see I reach a wide open cavern where I have to go way over to the side. That pillar is invincible and it has a terrible hitbox, I think it's maybe twice as wide as the actual model, either that or the camera just makes it feel like it is. It's a shame that kind of issue is the last thing you'll come across before seeing the credits. I don't think this part is anywhere near as good as the flying phase of Mundus earlier. You're probably just going to get snagged on some rocks and end up finishing the game slightly annoyed by that. Well that closes it out. All that's left is for Dante and his sidekick to fly off into the sunset. I thought pretty highly of this game before starting work on this video and if anything my opinion has only improved the more I've dug into it. Thankfully there's already a phrase that perfectly describes my feelings on the matter. Forgive me this, but I have to say it. The devil is in the details. Anybody can talk about how great it would be to play a game as Dante, the stylish demon hunter, but few people can take that idea and turn it into satisfying, fully fleshed out gameplay. 
In this case, the details just go on and on. There's a reason why the last hit of each combo is the most damaging. There's a reason you can taunt. There's a reason why cancelling Devil Trigger wastes a rune. There's a reason why Dante can charge up the pistols, and so on and so on. It's a perfect storm of mechanics that interact with each other in sensible ways. Of course, it's not all good news. The abrupt camera angle changes can be a problem, no matter how skilled you are. The environments sometimes feel overly restrictive. The story is nothing to write home about, and the execution of that story leaves a lot to be desired in terms of writing, translation, performance, and even audio mixing. The repeat bosses and backtracking might also be too much for some people, which is a pretty understandable complaint, even if I personally don't agree. Every game has a different focus though. In this case, the priority is definitely challenging, complex combat. Some later action games have surpassed Devil May Cry, but it's telling that they largely managed that by improving on what this game laid out in the first place. In other words, it may lack some things like aerial combos, but what use are those if you haven't implemented juggling first? As a first step for a new genre, it's an incredibly impressive work of art. I'm gonna let the credits play themselves out, and while that happens, I have a few little things I never got a chance to mention that you might find interesting. Nothing earth shattering, but I might as well point them out while I have the chance. The ranking system is more lenient than you might expect. To test it out, I went through the first mission on Dante Must Die using six holy waters without ever even attacking anything myself, and still got an A rank at the end because I collected enough orbs. Fighting harder enemies on Dante Must Die actually makes the orb requirement easier sometimes. Near the start, before I entered the courtyard for the first time, I changed to Ifrit, then swapped back to Alistair once I went through the door. That's because the enemy layout there is randomised, so there's a chance I would have been up against Blades instead. In that case, I'd prefer to have Ifrit ready to go. I never talked about the way the game sometimes chooses between two different enemy placements, but there's not much to say. It doesn't really add anything to the game, except maybe a tiny bit of replayability, but it's not a big problem either. It feels like something they just did without much thought, which is a little strange. In the middle of mission 3, I jumped just before the lightning hit me because it's faster that way. Only very slightly, but there's no reason not to do it. When I fought Nero Angelo for the first time, you might have noticed I grabbed the ledge here instead of jumping straight up. It looks like a mistake, but it's not. Nero Angelo likes to cheap shot you here, and Dante gets invincibility frames while he's in that animation, so it's safer. There's a few extra difficulty things I noticed on top of all the basic changes I mentioned before. One of Griffin's attacks is way more complicated on the higher difficulties, and the secret mission where you have to jump on skulls is made harder because they actively attack you. I'd be willing to bet there's more changes I never noticed as well. The work on the difficulty options is really outstanding. The shadows in mission 15 are the only enemies I skipped because I found them too difficult. This one is a bit of a long story, but I tried a few different strategies and nothing really worked out. It's a good opportunity to use Nightmare Beta, but I was getting hit too often, so I abandoned this fight altogether. The sad part is I forgot you don't have to enter this room at all to complete this mission. You can go to a similar room on the other side that's much easier instead. In mission 16, the timed fight against the fetishes works differently than you might expect. The timer can be cancelled by clearing the room, but the fetishes keep spawning until you kill a certain amount, so there's three different states here. If the timer is active, they can't ever go into Devil Trigger. If the timer completes, they'll all go into Devil Trigger immediately. If the timer gets cancelled, they don't necessarily go into Devil Trigger, but they have the option. Taking all that into account, the best thing to do is intentionally hold back on killing them all until the timer is nearly finished. That way you can kill as many as possible before any of them can go into Devil Trigger. Once it gets low, you want to clear them all out so that the countdown gets cancelled instead of completing. It's a little bit counterintuitive, but it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure it out, so it's a nice bit of strategy. I think it suits the game too, because it's kind of like an action hero defusing the bomb at the last second.
That about wraps everything up, but before we finish, I just have one last thing to say. Back in the days of arcade games, high difficulty could easily be seen as exploitive, and maybe a lot of the time that was true. The beautiful thing about Devil May Cry being a console game is that theory no longer applies. It's a hard game because Kamiya wanted it to be a hard game. There was no money to be gained by making it as challenging as it is, and there was so much extra effort put into the higher difficulties that nobody in their right mind could ever say they were just padding as they are in some other games. Kamiya made it that way because he wanted people to play and overcome this difficult game he had directed, nothing else. He even said as much himself many years ago, that Devil May Cry was a challenge to people who had only played casual games. My point is, if it's well designed, difficulty isn't your enemy, it's your friend. A good challenge is a sign that the game designer believes in you, the player. They believe that you're able to learn and overcome difficult situations, even if you don't believe it yet yourself. On this screen you can see my rankings on each playthrough. Normal is in the left column, Hard is in the middle, and Dante Must Die is on the right. I wanted to show this first of all so I could confirm that I got all those S ranks, but also so you can see my ranks on those more casual playthroughs. They're not very good. Lots of B's and C's in there, even a few D's. When I set out to do this playthrough I honestly wasn't sure if I'd be able to manage it. Sometimes things were bleak, but the sense of satisfaction when I came out the other side was immense. I know how easy it can be to become complacent, but you might be surprised what you can accomplish with a bit of effort. So in the spirit of this game I'd like to encourage you to take a shot at something yourself. It doesn't have to be Devil May Cry, maybe some other game you're particularly interested in. You might be surprised what you'll learn and how much more fun you can squeeze out of one of your favourites if you try some sort of challenge run. I hope that's not too condescending or sentimental of me to say. I just got a lot of enjoyment out of playing Devil May Cry this way. It's one of those things that reminded me why I even play games in the first place. Anyway, I suppose that makes for a cheesy ending, but at least it suits the game at hand. Before I lose any more of my style points, I'll just say thanks for watching, and I hope I'll see you next time.